discuss the President's 2024 trade agenda. I'm going to start by touching on some of the ways in which the Congress and the Biden administration can work together to build a trade agenda that will supercharge America's diverse economic base and create good paying and innovative jobs across Oregon and the nation. And I'll start with trade enforcement, because without trade enforcement, our trade laws aren't worth the paper they're written on. India's wheat subsidies, for example, distort prices and make it harder for Oregon farmers to compete in the Asian market. Mexico's illegal fishing practices are hurting the environment and its harmful energy regulations are undermining our clean energy suppliers. China has a rap sheet of unfair subsidies and practices so long that if I were to go through it, we would be here until dinner time. So I'm going to spare everyone that filibuster. Every single one of these unfair practices by foreign countries is directly hurting workers and companies in America, including in my home state. There's a lot more USTR can be doing, in my view, with the tools it has. And we want to work together to raise issues directly with trading partners, starting dispute settlement, or opening 301 investigations into unfair trade practices. In my view, that's the only way to hold trade sheets accountable and level the playing field for American workers and businesses. Second issue, trade barriers. Our economy thrives when our workers can make stuff in America and grow stuff in America and add value to it in America and then ship it all over the world. But you just can't do it with all these barriers. In my home state, one out of four jobs relies on exports. We have world-renowned exports from wheat to potatoes to wine to high-tech electronics, everything in between. But the success of Oregon's farmers and workers depends on the administration's knocking down barriers to help them compete in the global market and get their products on shelves. That's why, in addition to enforcing the rules on the books to hold trade sheets accountable, I want, working closely with the administration and USTR, to play offense. It's not enough to sell domestically. The United States has to expand opportunities in the global market for American exporters across all our industries. The negotiations with Taiwan, Kenya, Indo-Pacific countries could net big wins for our exporters in agriculture and manufacturing. But we're going to have to work with the administration to push even harder to crack down on tactics like unfair labeling, duplicative testing requirements, and ag regulations that aren't supported by science and are designed to put American workers, farmers, and ranchers at a disadvantage. Before I wrap up, I also want to note, particularly in my state, how important it is that we have a standard for high-tech, innovative industries. The United States needs to be a leader in setting the rules of the road for digital trade so our creators and innovators get a fair shake in foreign markets. And we're not going to take a backseat to anybody in the process when it comes to privacy, security, and antitrust enforcement. While lawmakers look to domestic tech regulation, we uh, must also push for digital trade rules that are going to protect a free and open internet, help small businesses, and push back on the China model of digital surveillance and censorship. I'm very pleased to see that the White House is taking charge of this issue, working closely with all in the administration, and vowing to work with the Congress on this issue. There are diverse stakeholders and agencies. I think the White House position of a whole-of-government approach is a wise one. I look forward to working on a digital trade position that reflects the need of American workers, businesses, and consumers. The American people finally deserve to know what the government's priorities are with regard to trade policy. I am concerned, and I've made this point to the administration, a number of people in the administration, I think that the administration needs to do more to work with the Congress and make sure the American people aren't kept in the dark. To this end, I want to make sure that the USTR and other parts of the Biden administration are clear and straightforward with Congress and the public. When you take meetings with foreign officials, it isn't enough to say, well, there was a range of bilateral concerns raised. That doesn't tell my constituents a whole lot about trade. We need to be told what trade barriers the USTR and other parts of the administration are trying to break down, how this is going to help American workers and businesses. If negotiators are meeting with the Japanese, tell us if you're pushing to get Oregon potatoes on shelves in Japan. When officials engage with Indonesia, tell us if you're pushing against unfair licensing requirements that hurt Oregon dairy farmers. 
If there are negotiations with Kenya, tell us how you'll push them to improve their environmental and labor laws or bring down barriers to biotech uh, products. Fishermen in Newport and ranchers in Prineville, they're asking me, tell me exactly how the administration and this trade office is helping their businesses thrive in the global market. So we need um, more light shed on trade policy in America, and we are going to persist, pursue that diligently. Enforcing laws on the books and making our government's trade policies clear <coughs> is a good place to start, finally, in leveling the playing field. I look forward to today's uh, discussion and working closely with the administration and all our colleagues on both sides of the aisle on this Committee on Trade Matters. Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Ambassador Tai. Uh, I, first of all, want to say I agree wholeheartedly with the Chairman's opening statement and his comments. As a matter of fact, uh, Senator Wyden's first two issues that he raised are the first two issues in my first paragraph. I read pres the President's trade agenda carefully. If we measured wisdom by word count alone, President Biden's trade policy agenda would be very wise. If we measured it in terms of creating meaningful opportunity for Americans, it is profoundly misguided, particularly in terms of enforcement approach and negotiating ambitions. This administration's enforcement record is the weakest of any administration in 25 years. Although the administration highlights regularly using the USMCA rapid response labor mechanism to help Mexican workers, that mechanism cannot supplant bringing cases to increase market openings for American workers. Such cases are sorely lacking. The USTR has yet to self-initiate a single enforcement action against China, period whether at the WTO or under Section 301 or under phase, the Phase 1 deal. Nothing. Today's announcement accepting a Section 301 shipbuilding petition, which could take a full year to complete, does not make up for over three years of inaction on China. When it comes to discriminatory treatment, our trading partners now expect USTR to simply note that it is considering all options as it did with Canada's decision to move forward with its discriminatory digital trade or services taxes and further expect that USTR's consideration of all options is likely to be indefinite. For example, USTR has not advanced our case against Mexico's discriminatory energy policies for nearly two years now. Administration plans for negotiations fare no better than they do for enforcement. For the fourth year in a row, the administration's trade agenda provides no plan for real negotiations to improve market access. Instead, the administration lauds the Inflation Reduct Reduction Act, asserting that our workers need to be shielded, subsidized, and micromanaged through industrial policy, even if it entails massively expanding our national debt. That is not only misguided, but as former Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Michael Mullen noted, our debt is, in fact, one of the top national security threats to the United States. What we need is market access. I recently traveled to Asia, the United Kingdom, and to other partners. Our partners want to make real deals with high standards. They want to trade with us rather than China, and they want to do it now. We shouldn't want that too. Because each day we wait is another day that Americans fall back further behind our competitors, including China. Make no mistake, tariffs matter, particularly for small businesses like our farmers. Australia and New Zealand each negotiated free trade agreements with Thailand. And since then, demand for premium U.S. beef fell by 30 percent because our cattlemen face a 50 percent tariff while those two partners face none. Whether it be Idaho potatoes and dairy, or Iowa soybeans and pork, or South Dakota wheat, or Texas cotton and beef, or Washington state apples, our farmers are the best in the world. That is precisely why a large number of farm groups wrote to you, Ambassador Tai, on Monday, asking for a real trade agenda and advancing dispute settlement reform so that we can open markets for them. United States manufacturing, innovation, creative and tech industries are second to none. If the administration will not negotiate tariffs, 
It should at least help workers in these industries by negotiating critical rules on technical barriers to trade, intellectual property, and key digital provisions such as non-discrimination and free data flows. Thus far, USTR has failed to do so in any of the so-called framework negotiations. And the trade agenda indicates this will continue. This benefits China, which is aggressively participating in international standard-setting bodies, pushing technology transfer and supporting data localization by countries, which could require our companies to store data on servers that are produced by Chinese companies such as Huawei, rather than on ones we host in the United States. The proposals the Trump administration crafted in coordination with this committee for USMCA, for technical barriers to trade, for intellectual property, and for digital trade ensured that we could regulate and also rise to China's challenge. Simply abandoning coordinated and reasoned proposals without consulting Congress is a profound mistake. I urge my colleagues to remember that when this administration told us that comprehensive congressionally approved trade agreements are a 20th century tool, its vision of the future is piecemeal through frameworks done as executive agreements, devoid of any real enforcement mechanisms. Ambassador Tai, the members of this committee know that attempts to bypass Congress are neither new nor groundbreaking. And they also know that such efforts are not sufficient or truly effective in creating the types of opportunities our citizens deserve. It is well past time this administration began working with Congress to meaningfully expand market access opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my, my colleagues. So, Ambassador, you can already tell 15 minutes into uh, the discussion today that a Democratic chair and a Republican ranking member are going to work in a bipartisan way on these issues, and we're interested in doing it with the administration. So uh, please proceed. We'll make your prepared remarks a part of the record in their entirety. Welcome. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and members of this fine committee, good morning, and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss with you the President's trade policy agenda. The Biden-Harris administration believes strongly that our economic policies should work to strengthen our middle class. In order to give all Americans a fair shot, we need to ensure broad-based access to economic opportunity. And our trade policy should be a tool that works together with our other economic policy tools to reach that goal. This is important because trade policy hasn't always worked that way. To respond to the many changes occurring in the modern economy, the world economy, and the world in general, we must bring a more open mind and be willing to innovate in the way that we approach trade policy by questioning and testing old assumptions, revisiting norms, and thinking both creatively and strategically. In this new era, we increasingly measure success and progress by the degree to which we are delivering real benefits to more Americans across our society, no matter where you live or whether you have a college degree. Our approach is one that addresses and advances the interests of all parts of our economy and does not pit Americans against Americans. So let me give you some examples of what middle out, bottom up trade policy looks like. First, we are using trade to empower workers because we know that they are the backbone of our economy. Their success is quite literally our success. This is about building our middle classes together with other countries and not pitting them against each other. And this is why we have prioritized strong labor commitments in our ongoing trade initiatives, including in our negotiations with Kenya and Taiwan. This is also why we have been so focused on utilizing the USMCA's rapid response mechanism, a key worker-focused feature of the modernized and reformed North American Free Trade Agreement that has garnered robust bipartisan support. Since 2021, we have used the RRM 22 times at facilities that span various industries, from automotive and garments to mining and services. These cases have directly benefited 30,000 workers through new independent unions, new collective bargaining agreements, 
higher wages, back pay, and reinstatement for wrongful termination. Advancing workers' rights abroad is what strengthens and empowers workers here at home, because only then can our workers compete fairly and thrive in this competitive global economy. Our enforcement efforts are also motivated by the principle of inclusivity, that is, ensuring that all Americans enjoy the benefits of trade. With respect to the producers and the workers in our steel industry, last year we secured a victory at the WTO that determined the illegality of the retaliatory tariffs that the PRC and Turkey imposed in response to the US Section 232 national security actions on steel and aluminum. Separately through the USMCA, we are actively championing the interests of our farmers and agricultural producers. We have pursued two cases now against Canada's dairy tariff rate quota allocation measures, and we are currently challenging Mexico's restrictive measures on biotech corn before a panel. We are also opening markets for hardworking American families and communities, especially our rural communities. Through negotiations, our administration has secured over $21 billion in new agricultural market access in the last three years. For example, after the U.S. and India terminated seven WTO disputes, India agreed to remove retaliatory tariffs on several U.S. products. This means improved access for chickpeas, lentils, almonds, walnuts, and apples, benefiting farmers across our country, including in Michigan, Oregon, California, and Washington. This means more market access for turkey, duck, blueberries, and cranberries, benefiting the farmers in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Massachusetts, and Minnesota. Trade should work for all Americans. Our goal is to stop pitting Americans against each other in our trade policy. And this is why we are taking unprecedented steps to incorporate more voices into trade policy making. Just as you stay connected with your constituents in your states, I've made a point of traveling the United States to hear from workers, farmers, and small businesses, and tribal leaders directly to better understand their hopes and aspirations and learn how our trade policy can address them. I am also meeting with civil society and labor leaders in addition to the big corporations and trade associations that have always had access to USTR. My job is to represent the entirety of the United States economy, not just those that can afford the Washington lobbyists. Our vision for a fairer future also applies to the international arena, because it turns out that we all want to grow our economies from the middle out and the bottom up. This is what drives our work at the WTO and in our ongoing negotiations with Taiwan, Kenya, and the Indo-Pacific. We are focused on economic engagement and collaboration efforts to drive durable economic growth and build our middle classes together instead of always pitting them against each other. Over the course of the last several years, it has become clear that domestically and internationally, we need an economy that is more resilient. That means supply chains that can adapt and rebound more quickly and easily from shocks and crises. Developing the tools to reduce dependencies and vulnerabilities and to incentivize stronger supply chains is a major priority for USTR, especially this year. We are gathering public input and will hold several public hearings on this. This effort will allow us to draw upon a comprehensive set of perspectives and experiences to help us identify more trade policy solutions. Part of this exercise includes developing more effective countermeasures to the PRC's unfair practices and the negative effects of those practices on our economy and workers. And I want to end on this note. For many years now, we have seen how the PRC's non-market policies and practices left unchecked have devastated many working communities and industries across our country, including many in your states. Steel, aluminum, solar panels, batteries, electric vehicles, and critical minerals, just to name a few sectors. As the President said during his State of the Union address, this administration will continue to stand up to the PRC. And we are prepared to use our trade tools in this effort, including through new Section 301 actions 
and our four-year review of the China Section 301 tariffs, which assesses ways to deploy tariff measures to more effectively and more strategically address the harms from China's forced technology transfer policies, such as cyber theft and cyber hacking, and related imbalances and inequities in the US-China trade relationship. This is also why, after close review of the Section 301 petition I received from five national labor unions, I have now initiated a full and thorough investigation of the PRC's longstanding efforts to dominate the maritime logistics and shipbuilding sectors. The union's petition raises serious concerns about harms to US workers, the shipbuilding industry, and US resilience. This administration is fighting every single day to put working families first, to rebuild American manufacturing, and to strengthen our supply chains. We're using trade to give everyone a fair shot while working with our allies and partners. I want to especially thank my USTR team serving in Washington, D.C. and around the world for their unwavering devotion and determination to serve all of America. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I'm going to pick up uh, lots to cover uh, on this China issue that you touched on at the end. Obviously, China is just throwing money at everything from solar panels to semiconductors, doing everything they can to drive American competitors out of business with a flood of, of cheap, cheap imports. So my own view is I think it was a good thing that you and the president opened a 301 investigation into the unfair trade practices in China's shipbuilding industry with the formal petition uh, from the steelworkers, AFL-CIO, and, uh, and others uh, ob obviously being very, very important in this issue. My question on 301 is uh, Congress gave you all the power to self-initiate 301 investigations into unfair trade uh, practices. And my question to you is, Ambassador, how can you all uh, use 301 more proactively to investigate and take action against China's unfair subsidies in some of these areas that I mentioned, the semiconductors, EVs, batteries, and solar. So it's good what you and the President did uh, here uh, just uh, recently in opening the shipbuilding one, but I want to see more proactive work from USTR because Congress gave you all the power to do that. What can be done there? Senator Wyden, as you know very well, Section 301 um, is uh, perhaps the most important enforcement tool uh, at USTR. Um, when we encounter challenges uh, throughout the world, uh, whether we advance them through negotiations, uh, through enforcement actions uh, under our FTAs, or uh, separately outside of our um, trade agreements through Section 301 action, um, this is one of the most important tools that we have to bring and to bear. Uh, so I can assure you uh, that um, we value this tool very much. Uh, we also um, look to um, appropriate tools for resolving the problems that face us. In this particular case, with respect to shipbuilding, this has been a longstanding concern in the U.S. economy. If you look at the petition, since uh, 1975, U.S. shipbuilding cap capabilities uh, have eroded, um, not just significantly, uh, but entirely eroded. Uh, we are um, uh, eager to take up this investigation uh, to follow the rules of Section 301 uh, and to uh, uh, work on determining first uh, whether or not there have been harms to the U.S. economy. Uh, I can assure you that with respect to China especially, uh, given the scope and scale of the challenge that we have with respect to China's non-market policies and practices, uh, that Section 301 uh, remains uh, very much at the forefront of our minds and in the development of our um, Let, me, let, me, let me see if I can get a couple more questions. And we want to follow that up with you because I want this used in the maximum fashion possible, particularly with you all initiating because that's why we gave you the power. Um, as, you, as you know... Uh, up here, we're very proud of the Brown-Wyden part of the USMCA. I understand that uh, 
You all have initiated 22 cases uh, using the rapid response uh, mechanism to enforce the rights of our small businesses and our workers. And yet, at some point, this expanding number reflects a systemic failure of Mexico to enforce the labor laws and a USMCA. Have you all considered moving beyond uh, rapid response and looking for more compliance through a state-to-state -state USMCA dispute on uh, labor enforcement? Well, Senator Wyden, um, before we uh, started regularly calling this mechanism the rapid response mechanism, as you would call, uh, we um, uh, our shorthand name for this was uh, the Brown Wyden mechanism. Uh, so um, I'm delighted that uh, um, you are following the developments uh, in our implementation and in our active use of um, this tool. Uh, very closely because you should absolutely um, uh, see this uh, as very much um, uh, your contribution to uh, modern trade policy. Um, <clears throat> there are multiple tools in the USMCA. There is the rapid response mechanism. Uh, as you also know, uh, there is an independent Mexican uh, labor expert board uh, that uh, assesses the state of the overall Mexican labor reform uh, on a regular basis, uh, providing uh, an expert assessment. Um, as you also well know, the Mexican uh, labor reform uh, that um, uh, came together with uh, the USMCA coming into effect uh, was always an ambitious project. Uh, that was even before uh, COVID became a part of our world. Uh, we remain uh, very, very uh, plugged into uh, the progress that Mexico is making, uh, but also the continued challenges in their implementation. And so, yes, uh, we have many tools under the USMCA, uh, including regular reports uh, from uh, USTR to the Congress. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, all of I'm, the tools uh, are available okay. and are ones that we consider I'm, using. I'm really out of my time, but I just want to get one other matter in very quickly because Democrats and Republicans are very much united on this, and that's dealing with Mexico's uh, discriminatory licensing processes in the energy field. I mean, we really are getting ripped off by, by Mexico. You all have started consultations with respect to these discriminatory actions, but when do you anticipate taking the next step and bringing a formal case over Mexico's you know, protection through these discriminatory licensing practices and harming our workers and particularly the ability to make sure that we tap the full potential of the Clean Energy for America effort, which was written essentially in this room. Senator Wyden, we look at that actively every single day. Um, the focus is on how to be most effective in resolving the challenges for our companies. Uh, we remain in close conversation with our companies and in terms of our decision-making and our timing, uh, let me assure you uh, that it also reflects uh, the um, uh, appetite uh, of our companies in terms of when and how to move forward. Okay. Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And by the way, I also agree with your questions <laughs> as well as your opening statement. Uh, I'd like to talk about Section 301, the, the 301 investigation, not the petition that you just accepted. Uh, th this investigation has now been going on for two years, and it's my understanding that uh, President Biden has recommended that there be a tripling of our tariffs on steel and aluminum for China, but that there may be some kind of a an interagency disagreement between um, the USTR and Treasury about tariffs. And the question I have is, when are we going to get an answer? When will this investigation end and a decision be made? Senator Crapo, I appreciate this question as well, because obviously this is something we've been working very hard on. Um, just a couple corrections. I think that what you are talking about is the review of the existing tariffs that we kicked off in the fall of 2022. So uh, we're calling it shorthand the four-year review. It's an unfortunate shorthand because it's a review that starts at year four, not a, not a review that last for four years, first of all. Understood. To your, to your point about two years, it's really been about a year and a half. Um, but uh, it, given the president's um, uh, uh, calling on USTR uh, to uh, consider specifically the um, uh, tariff adjustments on steel and aluminum trade uh, with China, I think that you should take that as an indication that uh, we are in very, very advanced stages of our interagency work, and that I expect that uh, we will come to conclusion very soon. 
All right, I appreciate that. I hope that that means very soon. Um, next, uh, as you know, the National Potato Council expressed disappointment with how Japan's ban on U.S. potatoes appeared in the national trade estimate because it didn't capture the full extent of the problem. A number of uh, your stakeholders also took issue with this year's NTE because of your decision to cut out a number of trade partners uh, by seeing if they were in our trading partners purport their barriers, by seeing if those barriers were uh, in their public interest. Did you take the opportunity uh, to discuss the ban of U.S. potatoes in your recent conversations with Japan? Senator Crapo, now this is a this is an area of uh, shared interest and dedication with respect to potatoes and Idaho in particular. Um, so uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, USTR has raised market access for table stock potatoes in all four meetings of the U.S.-Japan Partnership on Trade. Most recently in December of 2023, we will continue to press Japan to advance the request in a timely and science-based manner. And I also want to let you know that uh, in the person of our um, very dynamic ambassador to Japan, uh, Ambassador Emanuel, uh, USTR has uh, the strongest uh, and most active of partners in advancing this particular issue. All right, thank you. I'm betting that Oregon potato growers agree with that. Uh, and we urge you to continue to raise this issue. Uh, I want to move on to digital services taxes. Recently, when you were asked about discrimination against U.S. technology companies, you said, how many of these American companies are actually really American companies? Because they are actually paying taxes there as opposed to paying taxes here. Actually, those companies pay billions of dollars of taxes here, but they are paying more overseas because of digital discriminatory tax services, or DSTs. If you feel that it's problematic that U.S. companies are paying more taxes overseas, will you then commit to this committee that you will actually take action against DSTs rather than just consider it? And if countries continue to move forward on implementation of their DSTs, will you take action? Senator Crapo, with respect to these tax issues, this is one of those areas where I've always got to uh, um, acknowledge um, the, the, the jurisdiction of the, the Treasury Department, although Senate Finance uh, gets jurisdiction over both t uh, tax and trade. Um, I think one of the challenges, as I understand it, working this issue is uh, reflected in that pillar one, pillar two uh, negotiation that Secretary Yellen has led to address you know, that arbitrage over um, international uh, minimum taxes to try to level the playing field. So I know that this is part of a larger conversation. Um, with respect to USTR, um, our role in the digital services taxes uh, partnership with Treasury is really triggered around um, um, the architecture of a lot of these DSTs where USTR has um, run Section 301s, uh, assessed discriminatory impacts of these DSTs, um, and uh, moved forward uh, with respect to articulating um, uh, possible sanctions. Um, <clears throat> Those sanctions uh, remain uh, suspended. Uh, they remain part of our toolkit. And uh, we remain in very close touch with uh, our uh, Treasury Department colleagues um, and uh, in monitoring uh, what is happening in these jurisdictions. So I uh, just assure you that um, we are looking at this very carefully and uh, we value our tools uh, with respect to the leverage that they give us uh, in leveling the playing well, field. Are you for telling our me that? Secretary Yellen is the one I should be asking this question to? Uh, what I'm telling you is that with respect to DSTs, um, it is an issue where uh, USTR and Treasury authorities are both implicated. I think I understood you to say you're still looking at it. We are prepared to use the tools that we have. I hope you do. Thank you. Senator Stabenow and, uh, and Senator Stabenow will go next, and then Senator Grassley will go after Senator Stabenow. Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see you again and, and to have you with us uh, and to talk about such important issues, uh, both in terms of uh, markets, but also fairness and, and what needs to happen for American workers, businesses, farmers, and so on. I appreciate your efforts and the president's leadership as we work to support and our trade 
laws, both trade enforcement and leveling the playing field for our farmers. We just heard about potato growers. We have other issues, as you know, with our farmers that need to be addressed as well, as well as our manufacturers. And I just want to lend my voice to the fact that the four-year review of Section 301 tariffs on Chinese prod, uh, products needs to be concluded as quickly as possible in favor of both either extending or, or increasing tariffs on Chinese goods at, at, while we at the same time focusing on the interests of American workers. And I want to speak to something very specific and important to us in the auto manufacturing sector right now, because in Michigan, we know just how critical it is to level the playing field. Our state is as you know, put the world on wheels. We're very proud of that. We've got the best auto workers in the world and they're ready to build and they are building the vehicles of the future right here in America. And there's no doubt in my mind that we can outcompete anybody in the world as long as the rules are enforced and there's a level playing field. But the Chinese government's unfair trade practices, including heavy, heavy subsidies for Chinese automakers, pose a significant threat to our American manufacturing capacity and to our consumers and to our national, natural, national security interests, I would add. Allowing artificially low-priced Chinese EVs to flood the US market would cost thousands of jobs and endanger our shared goal of ensuring that the electric vehicle transition is led by American workers. Imposing Chinese EVs, Im importing them, many of which are equipped with highly connected electronic components and autonomous driving technologies would also create an unacceptable national security risk. It's essential that we protect our consumers, our American businesses, our, our workers, it, our critical infrastructure from being exploited by Chinese state actors, as we know. And so how does that fit in to the president's trade agenda? Senator Stavnow, um, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, I think that uh, uh, your state um, is actually one of the best examples of um, why we are advancing a different kind of trade policy. Michigan is a great agricultural producing state and also a great state with a um, industrial contribution um, to um, America and the world. Um, <clears throat> the specific challenge of uh, EVs um, and uh, uh, is actually a part of a larger pattern that we have seen over and over and over again. First, it was steel and aluminum. Then it was solar panels, again, where? I think in both Michigan and Oregon and right. other places in the US, we had a growing, innovative industry uh, in the early 2000s that got washed out by exactly these same anti-competitive practices. Enormous amounts of state support, fostering um, an overproduction uh, and, and overcapacity that uh, brought world prices down so far that no one could compete or, or survive. Um, so we know that we are facing this again on autos and EVs. We have to take action. Leaving these types of policies unchecked, we already know what's going to happen. We're going to lose the capacity to produce and compete and as we lose that capacity, it is so hard to rebuild that capability. So we have to take early action, decisive action, and we have to be really clear about why we're taking the action. We are looking for a level playing field because the current playing field is not level. For all the talk about free trade being the ideal, it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful concept. But it is also a beautiful dream because the world economy is not characterized by free trade, in particular when you look at the practices that are leading to the dynamics we're seeing on autos and EVs. So Senator Stabenow, this is um, a significant animating principle for us as we look at our tools at USTR, how we support American manufacturing industries, American manufacturing workers, how we can continue to innovate, and it is also an animating principle in how we look at how we can partner with other 
countries and economies who share our structures, share our values, both politically and economically. Let me just say as I close, two things. One, we are right now competing, and this has happened in other areas, but it's the Chinese government. It's not Chinese businesses. It's Chinese government against American businesses and American workers. And so it is absolutely critical. And with my ag hat, I won't go into questions, but just I know there are a number of agricultural stakeholders that sent you a letter earlier this week urging you to commit to an aggressive agriculture trade agenda. So important that we have those markets. Senator Vilsack, at the request of Senator Bozeman and I, has uh, added a robust funding to marketing uh, of our uh, agricultural products, and uh, we, need, we need those markets, and, uh, and we need the trade agreement. So appreciate um, your focus on that. We're always glad to have our ag champion in Thanks. the house. And another mm -hmm. senator who cares deeply about agriculture, Senator Grassley. Welcome, Ambassador. I'd like to discuss a prime example of this administration's abdication of leadership on trade. There's been a bipartisan agreement on this committee on critical issues such as free cross-border data flow, uh, data localization, open markets, and intellectual property protection. However, this has been undermined by actions of this administration, so other countries then end up setting the rules on digital trade. Uh, these bipartisan principles are the foundation of the digital economy and U.S. companies enjoy a significant competitive advantage relative to foreign competitors. Our competitors repeatedly seek to discriminate against U.S. companies and impede access to their markets, yet the Biden administration has pulled back from negotiations on digital service trades and rejected long-term, long-held bipartisan principles against discriminatory practices of our partners. Uh, USTR has abdicated its leadership role in this important issue. So why is USTR allowing other countries to set the rules that will put American companies at a disadvantage? Uh, this can't be consistent with USTR's mission. Senator Grassley, it's good to see you. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to um, ad address this concern that you have. I've heard it quite a bit, and I welcome every opportunity to explain uh, USTR's uh, approach. Uh, you are right with respect to ongoing negotiations around uh, data flows provisions, data localization provisions, and source code provisions. We have pulled back these long-standing proposals that we have made in those negotiations to make adjustments, in large part because we are connecting the dots. And I would, like to, I would like to encourage all of us to connect the dots because in addition to being a Senate Finance uh, Committee leader, you've also been a longtime leader on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I know, for instance, that you are a co-sponsor of the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, ICOA which the administration has expressed support for. I also know that you are a co-sponsor, along with many of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle here on Senate Finance, of the Kids Online Safety Act, which addresses uh, data security for children's data in the digital economy and in the digital um, sphere. What I wanted to reflect to you is, when you look at those long-time, long-term developed proposals in the digital trade negotiations on data, that those provisions are still largely based on an understanding that what we're dealing with is data as a facilitator of traditional trade transactions, goods transactions, data as a facilitator of e-commerce, data traveling along with you know, the information that has to be traded in order for uh, goods uh, to move across borders. And that was certainly the case 20 years ago. But today in 2024, what we have seen is that data has become the commodity itself, that data has become the powerful thing uh, that has value, that enables more innovation, that it enables, when you accumulate enormous amounts of it, uh, technological innovation like uh, a generative AI. And the issue is who can have access to that data? And also, where does the data come from? It, it comes from ordinary Americans. It comes from you, it comes from me, it comes from your constituents, it comes from our kids. Can, can and so, with respect to the security of that data, 
the um, attempts that we see up here on the Hill to assert the rights of ordinary Americans with respect to that data can you as fill, a trade matter. Can you fill in in writing? Because I've got to ask one more question. All right, can I just finish? I'll, I'll just finish my sentence. We feel very strongly that our provisions in our trade negotiations should reflect the the debates that are happening here and the um, legislative efforts that you all are making. Yeah. The last time you appeared before this committee, I urged you to negotiate lower tariffs on ethanol with Brazil. While I understand that you are currently negotiating this matter, the results have been lackluster. Brazil increased its duty on ethanol this year from 16 to 18% and continued to enjoy importing its ethanol tariffs free. Uh, this uh, ethanol competes with homegrown ethanol in California's low carbon fuel standard, but also in sustainable avi aviation uh, fuel. What is the administration doing to press Brazil's lower, uh, to lower its tariffs, and what concrete measures are the administration considering in the negotiation? Senator Grassley, your position on um, ethanol um, has been crystal clear from day one. This is a high priority for the administration as well. I'm currently also extremely concerned about Brazilian uh, market access restrictions. Um, <clears throat> we are in coordination with USDA, including at political levels, actively engaging with our counterparts in Brazil on market access barriers to U.S. ethanol, including those tariffs and regulatory barriers that you're talking about. Our objective is to ensure that U.S. ethanol can once again compete on a level playing field with domestically produced ethanol in Brazil. My latest engagement with my Brazilian counterpart, which happened um, uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, the Brazilians indicated to us that they understood at all levels, including from the White House, uh, the prioritization of this issue with them, how important it is, is to us and our economy, and their desire to find a way um, to uh, accommodate this priority. So we are actively working on it, and uh, the strength of your voice on this matter is an asset to us. Time of my colleagues expired. Yeah, Senator Cornyn is little, next. Little, little you can ask about big oil if you want to. Senator Cornyn. Ambassador Ty, I uh, had to do a double take on the title of this hearing. Uh, the title says, The President's 2024 Trade Policy Agenda. I really think it would be more accurate to say the President's 2024 Non-Trade Policy Agenda. The reason I say that is because the administration is not currently negotiating any free trade agreements, are you? Not in the traditional sense, Senator Cornyn. We are, tr we are negotiating mean new types of trade agreements. So the way you are negotiating these so-called frameworks uh, lack the tools for any um, market access that a trade agreement would provide, along with enforcement actions that could be taken to enforce that access, correct? Well, Senator Cornyn, this is an opportunity for me to explain again. No, um, you don't need to explain year. it again. You no, need the, to answer the, the my question. The traditional FTAs that we negotiate continue to pit Americans against Americans and sectors against sectors in a way that is entirely unsustainable, as we've seen in our recent experience. We well, know we can't Well, I know you filibustered Senator Grassley, but you're not going to filibuster now. Uh, the point is that absent trade agreements, there is no enforcement mechanism to make sure that American farmers businesses and workers aren't harmed by denial of market access to these countries that are denying that access for imposing huge subsidies to prefer their products as opposed to ours. There is no mechanism for enforcement, is there? Well, Senator Cornyn, the point is in uh, uh, securing market access to secure the market access, and we've done that with negotiations that are not FDAs. They have been moved faster. Uh, with India, for instance, uh, we've opened up 12 different categories, gotten lowered tariffs. Uh, new product from America is going to India. $21 billion in new market access over the last three years. We we'll see talk, results, let's talk about including, China including for, a minute. for farmers in, in Texas. Has, has the administration taken any enforcement actions against China? 
Um, the administration absolutely has uh, moved forward with an aggressive set of policies against China. Uh, Have you taken enforcement actions? Um, I suppose it depends on what you mean by enforcement actions. I but mean certainly enforcement actions. With respect, to, a, with respect to export controls on semiconductors, you've seen that. I'm There's not just talking there. about talk. I'm talking about actual enforcement actions against China. For I mean, I think that those actions have certainly accessing, moved markets. If you'll wait for my question, they are accessing the World Trade Organization seeking to dispute provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. Meanwhile, China continues to subsidize and prefer their products um, by spending a lot of money, making it much harder for American businesses to compete. Has the administration taken any sort of enforcement actions against China Today, in the World I Trade have... Organization or anywhere else to, um, to go after them? They are taking advantage yes. of that access in the World mm -hmm. Trade Organization against us, but are we doing it against them? Um, we have in the past taken lots of actions against China. When the was the WTO. last time you did it? Well, let me put it this way. Let me answer your no, original question. No, when did you do it? Well, it's been ineffective, Senator Cornyn, which is why we no longer do the things that aren't effective. Well, we you talked them into it effective. or what? We initiated an enforcement action today under Section 301 on Chinese non-market policies and practices affecting the maritime industry and shipbuilding industries. So, yes, we have this morning. Let me ask you about um, Texas is a major or the most, uh, uh, the largest trade exporting state in the nation. Yet um, in recent years, um, corn exports, for example, are down $500 million to 12.8 billion. Livestock, poultry, and dairy exports are forecast to decrease by 1.3 billion, uh, pork exports are down 300 million, soybean exports are projected down 500 million, and wheat exports are forecast down 800 million. What what explains this robust trade agenda that uh, that you say the Biden administration has, and the fact that market share for American agricultural products is down across the board? Well, Senator Cornyn, I'd have to look at um, the sources of your statistics to understand better what uh, basis the forecasts um, are, are made on. But uh, the last three years, uh, we have set records for American ag exports. You set records, but uh, it's a record decrease, not increase. No, no, no. Record, 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 high record exports for the last three years. And I'm happy to get those numbers to you. I'll be happy to share my uh, records with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank my colleague, Senator Cortez Mastow, next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ambassador uh, Ty, it's great to see you. Thank you for visiting me, with me uh, last week. One of the things we talked about uh, were titanium sponge tariffs. So l let me um, ask you this. As you well know, the United States currently imports 100% uh, of its titanium sponge, a critical material that is domestically manufactured into parts for fighter jets, for military satellites and other defense technologies. Over 90% of these imports come from Japan, our key ally and security partner. This trade supports American jobs, workers, and national defense, yet the U.S. is applying a 15% tariff to all titanium sponge, sponge imports. This is a tax that manufacturers in Russia and China do not pay, and our American companies such as Timet in Henderson, Nevada, are trying to compete with companies in these, in these countries. I I'm pleased that Senators uh, Blackburn and Tell Tillis on this committee, as well as Senators Capito and Manchin, have joined my effort to remove this tariff and support American security and jobs. Ambassador, my question to you is, do you support the removal of this counterproductive tariff, and what can, what can you do? Senator Cortez Masto, I um, uh, just want to uh, reinforce um, uh, how strongly we as an administration, certainly at USTR, um, uh, feel about um, enabling American manufacturing and American manufacturers. Uh, it can be a complex question because we do live in an interconnected world with respect to um, inputs and access to inputs. Um, so uh, I think um, what I would say to you is that um, uh, the issue that you raise and um, have been so uh, much of a, a, a champion for uh, certainly merits are looking at through a very strategic lens. Thank you. I, ho I hope you do, and I look forward to that um, quick 
review. Thank you. Um, we also talked a little bit about AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. I've been hearing uh, from many Nevada businesses about the importance of AGOA, and it's set to expire next year. I support the need to reauthorize uh, AGOA, but I also think there's a chance to improve the program. As we look to reduce reliance on, on China for critical minerals, I think AGOA is an opportunity to create closer ties to Africa in this space. I also think there is a need to create more economic opportunity uh, for women and girls as we uh, can leverage these trade tools for this purpose as well. So Ambassador Tai, what are your views as we look towards the need to reauthorize the program? Well, I think, uh, Senator Cortez Masto, that um, uh, this upcoming opportunity to reauthorize um, is also a tremendous opportunity to revisit um, and enhance. Uh, AGOA as a program, like so many of our trade programs, has been around now for two decades, more than two decades. Um, by the time it expires, I think it will have been a quarter of a century. A lot has changed. A lot has changed here in the world and uh, most importantly on the African continent. And so I think that we should be looking at how do we improve utilization rates. AGOA is our foundational program with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, utilization rates on average are low. How do we improve that? Secondly, as some of the countries uh, in Africa um, uh, really do develop and hit that middle income level, they become ready to graduate the program as it stands. How do we continue to build on the program so that we have a forward vision for the next stage of development and how the United States can be there as a partner uh, with uh, these countries in Africa? Another change in the last few years is the um, uh, coming into being of the African uh, Continental Free Trade Area, the AFCFTA, uh, which is um, the effort of the African countries themselves to integrate as a continent. So another question that's presented to us is an opportunity to examine how AGOA can enable US partnership with uh, the countries in Africa in a way that can help to reinforce that integrative effort. And I also have some thoughts as we uh, continue to go through those eligibility reviews every year about how we can sharpen the tools in AGOA how we can make them more flexible, how we can, once uh, a country falls out of AGOA, how we could develop tools to acknowledge progress um, uh, along the way to encourage that constant incentivization to come back into the program as opposed to just leaving a country out in the cold. So uh, I think that there's a lot of room for enhancement. I know how much uh, senators and members of the House care about this, and uh, I think that now is the right time to be working on it. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much. Thank my colleague, we've worked often with Senator Thune on trade issues over the years. Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Ty, welcome. And I would uh, echo what my colleague Senator Grassley said about digital trade, and that's something I've worked with the chairman on a lot. And it seems like we have abdicated our role as a leader when it comes to digital trade and uh, very quickly allowing China to step into the gap. But I want to focus specifically on ag trade. Um, that's been referenced already this morning as well. And you had indicated that uh, one of the reasons we have a, a trade deficit in agriculture is because of the strong dollar. And I don't deny that there are macroeconomic effects that, that impact trade. But USDA also acknowledge that one of the reasons we're running trade deficits is because of market access. And I can't honestly see anything the administration is doing on market access. Uh, I talk to agricultural organizations all the time. And by the way, um, we do have, we're running the largest trade deficit this year, ever. 17 billion this year, they're saying could be 30 billion this coming year. And net farm income was down $30 billion last year, will be down, they say, $39 billion this year. So thanks to inflation, input costs are going up, commodity prices are going down. One of the things that affects commodity prices is demand. And the way you create demand is to open markets. And I can't tell that the administration is doing anything on that. Now you say we've got a different approach to trade. And I understand that approach is grounded in things other than market access. But market access is what our farmers and ranchers are looking for to open up the market so they can sell their products and get the trade deficit back to trade surplus and get this net farm income back 
in the, in the positive column. I, I just, it's, it defies explanation. And you talk about working with our allies. We have some low-hanging fruit. Uh, UK, EU, I'm on a bill that uh, would create a free trade agreement with United Kingdom. They're one of our longest and closest allies. And there isn't a single free trade agreement that this administration has entered into. So I want to know what specific actions the Biden administration plans to take to increase U.S. agricultural exports in 2024. Senator Thune, there is so much that we have already done, as I noted earlier, $21 billion in market access over the last three years. That's, for example, the safeguard agreement uh, that we renewed with Japan that has allowed for high quality U.S. beef from your state to uh, increase access to a growing Japanese market. That includes um, the, uh, the, the 12 uh, tariff categories uh, with India, a growing market, growing opportunity for U.S. exporters. So I think um, we, we, have to, we, we have to acknowledge that. Market access can come more quickly, more effectively, more in more agile ways if we are looking for those opportunities to score what we like to call singles and doubles, to rack up the score that way, as opposed to tying up opportunities over the course of many, many years in FTA negotiations that sometimes don't ever come into being. Um, on the how about, how about deficit, the easy FTAs? How about the UK? I think there are no easy FTAs. I don't know if you followed, but uh, the UK and Canada have been negotiating an FTA that they stopped negotiating because the UK won't talk ag, ag, uh, ag market access. And in fact, in the, in, the, in the last years of the Trump administration, um, in those negotiations, uh, the UK had refused to put ag market access on the table. Ag market access is also something that has traditionally really uh, frustrated our efforts at large FTA-like exercises with the European Union. So we are we are absolutely committed. And Senator Thune, I want to let you know, um, I think our farmers uh, are the savviest business people that I talk to and work with in trade. They know their businesses. They know no trade. With respect to the deficit, we're concerned about the deficit, absolutely. And I, I think your concern is well placed. I just wish that our, um, our, our ag champions were as concerned about the industrial trade deficit as they are with ag trade because it can absolutely indicate um, a need for concern. Secretary Vilsack and I know, uh, along with our farmers, that we need to be able to diversify uh, our export opportunities because we are at a lot of risk. We are working very, very hard to do that. But in, in addition to a strong US dollar, one of the other challenges we have is a really, really strong economy, a strong consumer economy here in the United States that is actually uh, fueling our economic recovery. Take, for example, China where uh, they are uh, uh, in an economic downturn that they don't have the domestic demand to be able to uh, help them recover, which is why they're relying on an export-led recovery uh, program that's going to cause serious, serious problems for all the rest of us unless we do something. So I want to start um, on first principles, uh, reinforce um, how much we care about our ag producers. Uh, we want to make sure that they continue to win, and uh, we are working hard every single day to score wins for them. Well, my time's expired, Mr. Chairman, but I would just say I, I think that ag always ends up being at the end of the line. And, 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 and honestly, I mean, and can convince me, and so I can convince some of the agriculture organizations. I just met with all of them in my state last Friday. This is an issue. I mean, they don't think the administration gets it that we've got to be opening up more markets, that the issue is market access. It's tariff and non-tariff barriers. You focus on all these peripheral issues, none of which are at the core of why we can't get access to some of these markets around the world. And those are tariff and non-tariff barriers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank my colleague. Senator Hassan's next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ring Member Crapo for this hearing. And thank you, Ambassador Tai, for coming before the committee. Dependable U.S. trade policies reinforce American global leadership, reassure that our partners and allies um, are working together, and help drive down costs for American businesses and consumers. So let me start with a question about Log Inc., which I understand you just uh, made an announcement about. The Chinese government controls a global logistics management platform called Log Inc. Chinese companies that use Log Inc. interact with ports around the world, including our allies' ports that are important to our economic and national security. 
through these interactions, the Chinese government can predict trends or access early information on U.S. logistics and manipulate information to harm our interests. In past discussions with you, I've raised concerns that through this platform, the Chinese government could harvest sensitive national security information or commercial data that it could use to undermine competition from U.S. companies. So I'm really pleased that USTR is taking action. It's, this is an urgent threat that I've obviously been following, as you know, for a long time. What are the immediate next steps that USTR is taking to address the threat that logging poses to our national economic security? And what's the timeline for this investigation? Thank you, Senator Hassan. Uh, the immediate step that we are taking with respect to this investigation is um, first, a uh, Federal Register notice goes out today uh, to solicit public comment. Okay. The deadline closes for public comment on May 22nd. Okay. On May 29th, we will hold a public hearing. And again, um, the intention is to gather as much and uh, as high quality information as we can from all of the participants in our economy. Um, in the meantime, I will be requesting consultations uh, with um, uh, China as required under the statute. From there, we have up to a year under the statute to uh, run our investigation. But I agree with you. I think that uh, these challenges and the allegations made in the petition uh, are highly concerning yeah. and that uh, we would uh, do best by ourselves to accelerate our work. Well, I appreciate that very much. And um, will you commit to me, to briefing me and my staff on this issue as it develops so we can really work together to address this economic and national security risk? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, second question. Uh, recently, the U.S. and U.K. imposed new sanctions on Russian nickel, copper, and aluminum as a result of Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine. In addition to imposing sanctions on Russia, we need to support Ukraine's wartime economy. Ukraine has abundant critical mineral reserves. Facilitating trade of critical minerals with Ukraine would support their fight against Putin, and it would increase our access to materials needed for defense applications, renewable energy, and electronics. How is USTR working with Ukraine and our European partners on establishing strong trade relationships to help Ukraine's economy and to provide more alternatives to Russian critical minerals? Thank you, Senator Hassan. Um, the challenges presented by Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, uh, have activated um, an all of administration effort. Uh, we are all bringing our tools to bear. With respect to the sanctions, those are primarily uh, in the Treasury and uh, Commerce Department uh, bailiwicks uh, on those we work to support. Your question is specifically on what USTR is doing right. to help and uh, to support Ukraine. Um, here, uh, I wanted to uh, let you know that uh, we are negotiating a set of protocols with Ukraine uh, right now um, on things like uh, trade facilitation, um, uh, basically, you know, um, uh, good um, practices um, in trade. Uh, so that we can prepare Ukraine for a robust recovery. Uh, we're also talking critical minerals with Ukraine as well. Good. And all of it is um, to uh, gauge um, the engagement that Ukraine can provide now with a view to a future where um, Ukraine can um, uh, fully uh, take advantage of recovery opportunities. Excellent. I have other uh, additional questions on um, some of the other agreements on critical minerals uh, that you guys are working on. We will submit those for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank my colleague for a courtesy. This is going to be a hectic day. Senator Bennett, you're next. Chairman, I appreciate it, the opportunity to uh, ask some questions today. Ambassador Ty, thank you very much for being here. Um, I, I, uh, I guess I wanted to start and maybe spend most of my time on the America's Act, which uh, Senator Cassidy and I have now introduced as a recognition of the importance for us to work with our hemisphere, you know, on a whole range of issues. It's not just about trade, it's about migration, it's about economic development. It's, and we've, I think Bill and I have found a way in a, in a divided Congress to R remind everybody that we do have a set of values here that are pretty shared. 
I think in the hemisphere, we have a set of values that are pretty shared. And when I'm at home in Colorado and people there are saying to me, um, how are we going to compete with China? You know, they've got 1.3 billion people and, um, and, and they get to do whatever Chairman Xi wants them to do. We're a messy democracy and, um, and we're 330 million people. And my, and my answer to them is, well, we've got, you know, really good trading partners in Canada and, and in Mexico. We've got the benefit of what I think almost everybody on this panel agrees is a 21st century trade agreement in USMCA. Is there a way to begin to sort of think about how to build that out in the hemisphere? And that is what has led uh, uh, Bill and, and me to introduce the bill that we have. I wonder, I don't, I know you've noticed it because we've talked about it, but could you talk a little bit about how the administration is seeing the hemisphere? I'd be happy to hear anything you've got to say about our bill, but really what I want to do is understand what our strategy is here. Thank you so much for your leadership on this particular issue, Senator Bennett. Um, I remember seeing you at the City Summit of the Americas uh, yeah. that was held in Denver uh, last year. Um, and that was a very uh, visible representation of the connectivity of um, the Western Hemisphere economies uh, through the lens of cities and, and Colorado and Denver's place um, in that connectivity especially. Um, here I just start with saying that um, uh, this particular effort that's uh, embodied in the Americas Act um, is very much uh, uh, consistent with uh, the values of the administration and uh, the efforts of the administration that's embodied in the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity. I think that you know through through both efforts, we are looking at ways to, um, frankly, uh, become more regionally integrated. Uh, to have more of a coherent uh, regional economic identity. Um, and um, I think that the opportunities here are uh, in, for example, the America's partnership, I think of the 12 countries, uh, so that's 11 uh, uh, other than us, uh, we have FTA relationships with eight of them already. Now, they might be bilateral, they might be in groups like USMCA or, or the CAFTA, um, but there's already a strong architecture with respect to the kinds of trade disciplines we've established between ourselves. I think the real opportunity there, and I think that this is maybe an interpretation of um, you know, your comment about uh, USMCA, I, I think the opportunity there is one, um, the USMCA uh, is right now our, our gold standard. Uh, how can we upgrade a lot of the rules in these other relationships and, and bring them up to today? And then the second one goes to supply chains. As we're, as we're, and that's the economic um, integration piece of it. And I, I think that, you know, again, in terms of um, our new, more strategic approach to trade, we will want to look at this sectorally. And this is part of the work that we're doing, the America's Partnership. But I think that this is also consistent with the spirit of the America's Act. I would say, I mean, it's our job, obviously, to convince Chairman Wyden and, and the ranking member, uh, Senator Crapo, that this is something that merits the attention of our of this committee and the Congress, but I do think the benefit of it is that then it will last from from administration to administration, which is the kind of predictability that our partners need, and I think, frankly, Colorado's producers need too. So I'm I'm grateful for the work the administration is doing on it. I'm hopeful that we can get to a place where we persuade our colleagues that figuring out how to institutionalize it is important. I mean, you think about it, in the last 20 years or so, China trade in this region, in, in Latin America, has gone from $12.5 billion to $480 billion. That's a 4,000% increase in our region with our neighbors. And that's to say nothing of the infrastructure that they're building and the debt traps that they're creating. I just think there is a huge opportunity for us. I'm out of time. I look forward to working with the chairman and the ranking member on this. And Senator Cassidy has been an amazing partner and you to see if we can advance the ball as far as we can between now and the election. Thank I, you, Mr. I, chairman. I thank my colleague. We'll follow up with you and Senator Cassidy. Let's see. The next is Senator Tillis. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ambassador. Thank you for being here. Uh, have have you or are, are you aware of uh, a bill that uh, we put together working with uh, Senator Stabenow and uh, Casey on the uh, Fighting Trade Cheats Act? Also, Senator Brown. Yes, I am. Uh, you all have you all taken a, a position on on this yet? Um, as an administration, I don't believe we have. I'll check with my team. Although I think we've. Not yet, but um, I think we're always prepared to provide technical assistance in the meantime. Yeah, what uh, the reason I'd, uh, I I think it'll be helpful. I mean, the whole concept behind this. Look, as a, you know, I had a lot of Republicans looking at me and say, "What are you doing, creating a private right of action?" I said, "Not all private rights of action are bad. When you're able to leverage the corporate attorneys who would go after trade cheats, mostly from China, it becomes a force multiplier." for an agency that just doesn't have the capacity today. So what we're really talking about are being able to bring more cases forward that the department right now is not gonna be able to do on their own. So hopefully, I, you know, I think that we've crafted it properly. I think that it would be a great tool and it would, it would be a complement to, uh, to, to getting to a backlog you're simply not going to be able to. China does this remarkable job of laundering products um, and getting to a point where it's virtually impossible to go after all of the examples of cheating. Um, so it came out of uh, a suggestion that I had with a company in Charlotte called uh, Charlotte Pipe, uh, where uh, the, the theft, the intellectual property theft and uh, uh, use cases for Charlotte Pike are, are Pipe are extraordinary. That there is a facility in China that looks like the old Charlotte Pipe Foundry in downtown North Carolina, downtown Charlotte. I mean, just theft. And they came up with a good idea. I know their industry supports it. I hope we can. And I believe that it could be used maybe as a tool for, uh, for the administration for really going after these trade sheets. So that's my shameless commercial for what I think is very sound policy that uh, has good, strong bipartisan support. So we'd like to get a an official position, if we may, because I think it'd be helpful in getting it passed. Um, I, uh, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about um, trade in, in general, but before I do, I, 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 we've got an issue. I've had this discussion with, uh, uh, with Senator Coons on the TRIPS waiver. Uh, I'm assuming that you all, and, and I, I co, uh, I've chaired, and now I'm ranking member on the Intellectual Property Subcommittee with the uh, Senator Coons, we both think trip waivers are really bad. I think the administration still thinks they're good. So instead of asking you whether you think in hindsight uh, some of the trips waiver uh, decisions that were made in COVID era were a good idea, tell me your, uh, tell me your, your case for why you thought uh, whether it was a good or a bad idea. I'm assuming you still think it's a good idea. Tell me why you think it's a good idea. Well, um, Senator Tillis, on um, the trips um, exercises uh, at the WTO. Um, the reason why um, we think it is a good idea to continue to have these conversations at the WTO is because um, the public's access, um, the access of ordinary people, whether they're Americans or they are people in other advanced economies or in developing countries, um, to uh, the miraculous, life-saving medicines uh, that are developed, many oh, of them I agree. here, uh, the, the is question, a really important, I agree. Is a really important and topic. The, the, uh, the only thing more important than access is the actual creation of these very promising vaccines and cures. And if you don't get it right, if, if, if you take a look at what we did with Project Warp Speed and how this country, in historic record time, produced a vaccine, nobody disputes that. Um, it only happened because the whole of government came together and produced this, but the biotech uh, industry took certain risks. There weren't all winners. There were some failed projects out there. If you send the message that the next, and it won't probably be 100 years, the next time you want to do a project warp speed, that for all the work that you could put into it, you could have your intellectual property time horizon collapse and not be able to recover your investment, I don't know that people will line up and necessarily marshal the resources the way that we saw it uh, during COVID. Intellectual property protection, I get access to drugs, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, publishing or providing, sharing vital proprietary intellectual property. 
And if we don't get this right, it will have a chilling effect, not only in terms of uh, biotechnology, but I think across all sectors, it will destroy our, our, I think, our position right now as the world's innovator. Senator Tillis, if I can just respond very, very quickly. I'm, sure. I'm gonna say I agree with you that the question is about getting it right. Uh, that also innovating and creating all of these um, incredible medicines um, and uh, having them out of reach for the patients who need them is, is also not the right place to I be. Agree, so but it's, I, but I it's, about, the, it's about where we I need to I agree, but you'd be hard-pressed to the find the, an absence or, or no access, if, if I may, because she responded to a point that I think is very important. Uh, there were no vaccine deserts. The vaccines were out there. The TRIPS waivers were not necessary to provide more COVID vaccines. So that would not be a good example, in my opinion, to uh, particularly against the risk of Senator, failing to innovate Senator, in this country. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador Ty, welcome. We are glad you, that you're here. I want to talk to you about enforcement actions against China because I hear a lot about this in Tennessee. Theft of intellectual property, the genocide, the crimes against the Uyghurs, uh, what all is happening in Xinjiang, um, the military aggression against Taiwan, and of course, you've got TikTok and what we're seeing there. So I know you've just announced the 301 on shipbuilding. What other enforcement actions have you taken against China? <clears throat> So um, the uh, action from this morning, um, and thank you for keeping up with the, the breaking news. We wanted to make sure that uh, there's an opportunity to talk to Senate Finance today. any others that you have done? Uh, yes, Anything to hold China to account? Every single day what we do, whether it's directly vis-a-vis -vis China or it's uh, work that we are doing uh, with other partners and allies. Okay, but no new cases against China at the WTO on your watch? I mean, cases against China at the WTO have not netted us structural change in China. So, um, Okay, so you're not going after them, and you fail to use the dispute settlement mechanisms under the Phase One agreement, correct? The Phase One agreement enforcement, uh, we absolutely are uh, advancing in terms of uh, raising the issues with China. We have done that. Um, right now, I think probably the most important uh, aspect of China enforcement uh, set aside 301 that we just started today on shipbuilding uh, it comes to the review of the existing tariffs and how we can make them okay. more effective and then strategic. Let's talk about agriculture. We hear so much from our Tennessee farmers on this, and we know that China is not living up to their purchase uh, commitments that they made under the last administration and under President Trump's phase one deal. So what are you doing to hold China to account for those purchase commitments? I think that we are staying very, very strong on uh, not not giving them more space. Um, over the course of the last three years, we have faced a lot of calls to release the tariffs on China. And the point that we have made over and over again is that we do not see action from China that would merit us going easier on So what are you doing them. about that? See, this is our point of frustration, is that <clears throat> there are purchase commitments that they made, but they are not keeping up with those. So we have cotton and soybean producers that are saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, who is going to stand up for us? And unfortunately, when they look at USTR and this administration, they don't see people that are going to bat oh. for them because you have had no new actions. There are no new cases that y'all have brought I think that's against really, China. Sorry. I think that's a narrow way of looking at it. Uh, we've, also, <clears throat> we've also not um, uh, brought more retaliation on our farmers because that is a really important part of our trade policy, which is to continue to uh, improve uh, the export opportunities for our farmers. One of the challenges we have with China is an over-reliance on China as a customer. They're not a monopoly if we made here, a but they're, they're, a, they're a consumer yes. that is dominating our demand. Countries would expect us to keep our commitment if we had made them. China is not keeping their commitment. Before my time runs out, I do want to talk with you about digital trade, and I thank you for the response to my letter on 
small business impact and of the digital trade rules. I disagree with you on that because I think the change in digital trade policy is uh, not one that has been welcome. And the Biden administration might think the change is going after big tech, but what you're doing is really hurting countless small businesses. And you made a comment in your opening that you were slow walking the changes. You brought up the work we were doing in Judiciary Committee on Privacy, and you brought up COSA as a justification for uh, not doing something on digital trade provisions. And I would remind you that um, international agreements on digital trade do not preclude countries from passing privacy laws. You can look at the EU, you can look at GDPR, you can look at New Zealand, you can look at Canada, you can look at Australia. So that is an excuse and not an accuracy. I see my time is over, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I thank my colleague, Senator Cassidy is up. I note that Senator Casey has been so patient as well. Everyone is trying to help him and we'll stay with the, within the rules. Senator Cassidy, you're next. I will defer because I just All right. That makes Senator in order of appearance, Senator Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Thank you uh, for that as well coming in. Thanks for the work and for the task that you're taking on on this. Obviously, all of us have questions. We've continued to be able to press on free trade agreements, and it has been the frustration of this committee and it's been the frustration of many of our ag producers in my state about there is no ongoing FTAs that seem to be moving at all. And that has that changed? Are there any free trade agreements that are currently being negotiated? For your ag producers, I just want to make the case that, uh, and, and reassert, uh, we are working for them every single day, and we are scoring wins for them without having to do the long but, negotiations in a free trade agreement. So the short answer to be responsive to you is, no, we're not yeah. doing the big comprehensive agreements that are really great for ag and terrible for our industries, but we are nevertheless securing wins, $21 billion right. no, I, for I, our I get that. The, the, over the last three the, years. The, the challenge of that is, when it's not an FTA, there's no certainty on it, and uh, that executive agreements come and go with administrations, an FTA has some semblance of certainty on it where we at least know what the plan is and what the long-term relationships on that are. Uh, I know Senator Blackburn had mentioned about China and the WTO that we've not initiated any new cases on that. I heard from you saying, hey, we're not going to win anything anyway, and so we're just not going to do it and not spend time on that. There is a messaging portion of that. Uh, that I think is significant as well, to be able to go through the existing tariffs review that's been ongoing for two years. And I know you mentioned uh, Senator Crapo, that's only been a year and a half. As I'm counting time on that, I think it started in May of 2022. And so it's been, that sounds like two years to me on that. So <laughs> two years of that process on that. Do you know when that review is going to conclude? So Senator Langford, just to, to be really precise, um, the review started in September of 2022. And so I don't want to, I don't want to okay. argue with That's you right. over six months, but uh, soon, very, very soon. I have a high degree of confidence that we concluded soon. So the reason I ask you that is because I know President Biden has asked for consideration. Uh, it hasn't started yet for consideration on a 25% tariff uh, on China on steel, 10% on aluminum. Uh, Wall Street Journal reported, and we're still waiting on the details in this, Wall Street Journal report on today, it would be 0.6% of the steel coming in the United States is what this particular tariff, and I don't know if that's an accurate number or not that was reported today, so I'd be interested to know if it ends up being 0.6% of the steel coming in the United States, or that's even close. My, my question to you, though, is if we're at the point where the 7.5% review from the previous administration, we're a year and a half into it, the 25% review, how long will that take until a decision is made since that consideration started today? I think that the language was he called on USTR to consider. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't take that as a starting, I, I wouldn't consider that a starting point. Um, as I just want to give you the best information sure. and the more ho most holistic response. Um, it has been a comprehensive review of the existing tariffs. Uh, you're right, it's taken uh, 19 months now, um, but I have a high degree of confidence that we are coming to a conclusion and we'll be able to finalize it soon. Okay, so for the, this next group, for the 25% and 10% tariff, steel and aluminum on that, how long until a decision is made on that one? 
uh, the entire, so what I'm trying to tell you is that the review on the tariffs takes place in its entirety. Uh, so that when we conclude the process, you should see um, you should see a, a pa an entire package. So all of that would be included together at some point. The Wall Street Journal reporting today that it would affect about an additional 0.6 percent of the steel. Is that accurate? Not accurate? Or where do you think that number came from? They they quoted just an administrative source uh, or an administration source on that, but I don't know who that would be. Obviously, I've not seen the article, Senator Langford, but I will take a look and I'd be happy to respond to you after I've taken a look. Okay, that'd be helpful, thank you. Uh, as far as new markets for on the ag side of things, I know you're working through some of that, trying to be able to help uh, existing agreements. Uh, are there other new markets on the ag side that are pending? Yes, so there's the work that we've done with India across uh, uh, 12 uh, tariff areas where we've opened up um, opportunities for um, uh, tree nuts, um, cranberries. Um, this is a little bit of a test for me. I think it was blueberries, uh, turkey, um, uh, duck. Uh, we'd also worked on pork earlier. Um, it, with Japan, we've opened up, up with the beef safeguard. We've got ethanol, uh, more ethanol going to Japan now too. Jordan just dropped tariffs on eggs. Uh, Colombia, uh, they just changed course. They've reopened to our poultry exports. Bangladesh dropped uh, cotton fumigation barriers, which uh, will allow us to ship more cotton. Uh, Ghana has opened up access to meat and poultry as well. And uh, this is just kind of a top right. level right. in terms of our key things. I've seen some of that on the tree nut side. The chairman and I have had this conversation before talking through different aspects of how do we actually help individual companies make complaints, especially against China. We have companies in my state that know that steel or other products are being dumped into the, into the market. Uh, for them to be able to initiate the challenge on that has been burdensome. As you know, they've got to get with a foreign entity to get them to show their paperwork mm -hmm. as well. It's very difficult. It's an area that we need to be able to work together as a committee. The chairman and I have talked about this, and we need to be able to get some solutions for those time, companies time, to get a solution. Time of the gentleman's expired. There has been an awful lot of collegiality here in the last few minutes, and I want to see if it would be acceptable. Senator Brown, we'll let Senator, Cass, uh, Senator Casey go next. And if we could, among colleagues, say Senator Casey, Senator Brown, and Senator Cassidy. Is that acceptable? Great. Senator Casey, thank all my colleagues on both sides for all the patience. Senator Mr. Casey. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for that. And my colleagues, I also want to add Senator Whitehouse to that. Yes. That chorus of charity here. Yes, thank um, you. But Ambassador Ty, I'll, I'll keep within my, my time. I want to start by thanking you for your public service and your, your focus um, in leading the trade office um, on a worker-centered approach to trade, and I'm grateful for that. Just want to get one thing on the record before I get into the, a broad question. I want to thank you for your continued commitment to securing the full set of dairy export benefits that we work so hard to uh, establish in USMCA. I encourage you to continue to exhaust all avenues to get China to fix how they ad are administrating USMCA uh, terry, uh, dairy tariff rate quotas, so-called TROs, in order to see the export gains the agreement was clearly designed to deliver for our dairy industry. The status quo with Canada on this front is simply unacceptable, and I stand ready to support USTR's work uh, in securing fairness for Pennsylvania dairy farmers. So you and I have talked about this, just wanted to put that on, on the record. But here's the broader question. It's about Nippon Steel and the, the potential acquisition of U.S. Steel. Um, my principal focus there is the, the uh, high likelihood of loss of union steel worker jobs in the Mon Valley of southwestern Pennsylvania to, to non-union states. But I also have a major concern, of course, about national security. In Pennsylvania, workers in industry are all too familiar with how foreign actors seem to game the system with regard to national or industrial subsidies, state-owned enterprises, the use of forced labor and more to sell their products in the U.S. market at unfairly low prices. Another way of saying all that is China, China, China. Unfair trade practices like dumping have put far too many Americans out of work. The practice serves to diminish the capacity of our industrial base. In the case of my home state of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania steel that risks our ability to adequately supply our, uh, our infrastructure and defense needs. Oh, Nippon's <laughs> potential acquisition, the big concern yeah. among many, yeah. are its ties to China. Exactly. Senator Brown made reference to a recent report um, that, that is entitled Forge Friendship 
Nippon China industrial base risk. I won't go into that, but uh, Horizon Advisory was the one who put out that report. We've already seen early indications of how these external influences in, in China can impact robust trade enforcement here in the U.S. So I'd ask you about the dangers of that, of letting uh, a foreign entity, a foreign country in this case, China, determine the outcome of trade investment or trade enforcement in the U.S. Senator Casey, thank you uh, for raising this very, very important subject. Now, I know that there is a CFIUS process that is ongoing, and you haven't right. asked me specifically about it, but I do yep. want to be careful how I talk about this as well. Just to note that, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about the CFIUS pro process subject to the confidentiality rules. Uh, nevertheless, um, I, I, I did want to really reflect to you that I, I hear what you're saying overall in terms of, again, we've been to this rodeo before. Um, and um, you know, just um, just maybe taking a couple steps back and looking at it more broadly, um, I was talking to uh, our chief agriculture negotiator, Ambassador Doug McCaleb, who's sitting behind me, uh, who grew up uh, on a farm in Western Pennsylvania, uh, and he was telling us about his uncles um, who were factory workers uh, in the same community, and uh, how um, uh, their um, uh, factory was bought by uh, a foreign company. Um, I didn't even bother to ask uh, which country, but just a foreign company. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, what happened uh, to them, uh, something that they had happened to their neighbors and their friends as well, which is that uh, after the acquisition, um, the, the company moved, moved the factory somewhere else. Uh, and that that factory shut down and um, fundamentally affected uh, the landscape of that community, but also bit by bit, um, the strength of our manufacturing cap cap capability. So just keeping it at a, at a higher level, I, I just want to acknowledge that um, these types of uh, transactions um, are actually things that we have seen for a long time and continue to live with uh, the consequences. And I think that that is something that we at USTR uh, are very uh, thoughtful about. Ambassador, thanks very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank, thank my colleague, and again, I thank everybody for the collegiality. Senator Brown. Thank you, and um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank good to see you again, Ambassador. Thanks for serving our country so well. Um, I, communities like mine, I have many of the same issues that uh, Senator Casey does, especially sort of central Pennsylvania, west into Ohio, of closed factories and jobs leaving town because of bad trade agreements. Uh, and um, American workers know how to compete. And I, I want to take off a little on what Senator Casey said about Nippon and trade enforcement. The ITC decision, more and more people are saying, could have come out differently if U.S. Steel had been part of a, of a seamless, if you will, uh, in steel industry in our country, but they weren't. And um, that, that may have made that decision go the wrong way. That's why I'm particularly concerned about that merger. Um, I know Senator Casey's talked to the White House, so have I, talked to the economic advisors, talked to you about that, and, and we're counting on this administration. I know the president's in, in Senator Casey's state today. At the USW, we know how Nippon didn't bring workers to the table. Cleveland Cliffs, I'm not advertising for one company to buy. It's not my choice, not my decision, but I'm advertising to one company not buy um, this this plant, this um, this iconic U.S. steel company. So, um, but thank you for that. I want to talk about, uh, if I could, and again, thanks, Senator Casey. Go ahead if you need to. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, I want to talk about what Mexico is doing with steel. In 2019, Mexico signed a joint agreement with the United States promising to keep imports to historic levels. The United States lifted the 232 tariffs. Um, Mexico isn't sticking to their side of their agreement. Steel products like conduit are surging. I'm hearing from Ohio companies about the demand damage it's, it's, it's causing. I'm introducing a bill with Senator Cotton, Stop Mexican Steel Surge Act to reimpose 232 and allow the administration to use quotas. Uh, will you commit to holding Mexico accountable to protect American steel workers? Senator Brown, my team and I are uh, absolutely working on this, uh, and this is something easy for me to commit to okay. every Thank single you. day. Thank you. Uh, one last uh, question. Now's not the time to let up on countries like Mexico and China. The administration must keep the 301 tariffs in place and, uh, and, steel and increase them where necessary in areas like solar products and steel to address China's unfair trade practices and attempts to undermine our national security. I may be the only state that has major steel production 
and we have for sure the only state with the largest solar manufacturer in the country in northwest Ohio, a different part of the state. Um, China's consistently demonstrated they will not play by the global rules of trade. We're, we're concerned about dumping electric vehicles. I know you are too. I know the chairman is. We're concerned about steel. We're concerned about their cheating and circumventing and manipulating to get ahead, targeting our manufacturing base. But just uh, sort of an open-ended question. What do you plan to do at USTR Ambassador to stand up to China and protect American jobs, especially in industries like solar and and, um, and uh, I'm sorry, solar and steel. Senator Brown, um, thank you for your leadership on these issues um, and uh, for uh, being such a, a clear and strong champion uh, for uh, our, our critical industries um, and um, their need to be able to survive before they can thrive. Um, at USTR, uh, we have a lot of tools, uh, obviously, Section 301. Um, we have um, a, a lot of tariffs deployed. Uh, we are in the process of, and uh, the final stages of a process for assessing uh, how those uh, tariffs can be more uh, effectively and strategically deployed with the goal in mind of um, uh, more effectively and strategically um, creating countermeasures uh, with respect to the unfair uh, practices that harm our industries and our workers. Um, on, on solar as well, um, I know that we, are, uh, we have authorities under um, Section 201. Uh, we uh, have been looking at all of our authorities and looking at how we can bring them to bear um, to address this challenge of uh, revitalizing an industry that we are on the path to having and growing that we lost uh, because of um, the inability to compete with an unfair advantages uh, from uh, the Chinese marketplace. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, coupled with our uh, climate um, needs, um, how do we uh, reestablish uh, American leadership in this in this field. Um, so uh, we're looking at our all our tools. And uh, Senator Brown, I know that uh, you are one of the foremost leaders in developing new tools as well. Uh, I know that you have um, uh, bills out there too. Um, this is an area where I commit as well to continuing to work with you to develop those tools uh, that are fit for the challenges of today. Most of our tools date back to the 1970s and the 1980s. Thank you, Best. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think my colleague and uh, uh, earlier um, Ambassador Ty said that they've used uh, the Brown-Wyden uh, concept 22 times, and we talked about uh, ways in which they could apply it to other areas as well. So thank you for all your, all your leadership, and wonderful to partner with you. Senator Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ty. I'd like to continue the conversation we had regarding shrimp a couple days ago. Um, just for table setting, a whistleblower has found unsanitary, unsanitary positions and rampant labor ab abuses in the, Indian, in the India uh, shrimp industry. Uh, the Department of Commerce has put on countervailing duties with rates of 3.89 to 4.72%. Now, I understand that CBP has a role in enforcing forced labor designations, uh, and we recognize that the USTR has put out the CVD. Um, I, my shrimpers are saying, my gosh, if I gotta go to court to make this happen, I'm gonna be out of business before there's actually relief. So if you were channeling, if you were speaking directly to my shrimpers, who are being put out of business by labor abuses and subsidies, uh, what can we, how do you reassure them, my gosh, this issue is going to be taken care of and you don't have to spend millions on lawsuits? Well, I begin by pointing to you, Senator Cassidy, and the fact that you and I have been talking about this, this has been um, literally one of your highest priorities uh, since the day we have sat in this formation. Um, so uh, uh, you did um, share with me uh, the report um, on the abuses in this particular industry in India. Um, USTR is part of the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force that was created as part of the USMCA implementing bill, but it goes more broadly. Uh, we sit on that alongside the Department of Labor as well as um, a CBP. Um, uh, we can uh, prioritize, continue to prioritize um, the addressing of this particular issue. I think that with respect to our relationship with India as well, um, that has been evolving uh, in very important ways. Um, I do raise this issue with my Indian counterpart. Um, it's not an easy conversation. Uh, we will continue uh, to 
champion this particular issue because I, I take your point, and, and I think that you know, with respect to the logic of the trade policy that we are advancing, it is to ensure that we can champion um, the survivability uh, and the opportunity to thrive for all of our industries, um, and that no one's asked to sacrifice themselves for someone else. So, if the person, the shrimper watching right now, uh, would say, "Okay, out of all that, is there something in particular?" that we think will have an immediate effect? Or will it be more lawsuits and more kind of cajoling, but it's hard to have something hard and fast? Senator Cassidy, it occurs to me that uh, what we could um, do, um, uh, hopefully fairly quickly, certainly something we could do at USTR, um, is to uh, try to convene um, with um, our partners at CBP um, and uh, also with yourself um, and uh, uh, have a um, have a session uh, where we can really probe um, what our options are um, in the very near term. I'd appreciate that because there's also a concern that WTO will push the U.S. to have a so-called pass-through consideration. That if the uh, if the upstream is getting the subsidy and selling to the downstream processor who has to freeze it to ship it, that 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 kind of um, uh, subsidy that they're giving gets buried within that transaction. But that seems if we're decreasing the price for the downstream guy to freeze and ship, it's still a subsidy affecting our shrimpers, if you will. Uh, let me take that one back with uh, my team uh, and drill down on it a bit more. Um, uh, we are um, uh, very, very um, uh, vigilant when it comes to uh, the WTO negotiations. And I appreciate the flag for you. And I promise you follow up. There's also a concern from my rice people that they say that if it were not for Indian subsidies of rice, that they would have like roughly $850 million more in export. Uh, so if we can add that to the agenda, I'd appreciate that. 100%. That issue I know very well. Uh, going back to um, uh, steel and aluminum, uh, we've spoken about our proposal for a foreign pollution fee, which I've introduced with Senator Lindsey Graham, and I know that Senator Whitehouse has something similar on his side in which we would uh, put a tariff relative to the avoided cost of environmental um, um, compliance with international environmental norms, which would principally apply, apply to China, but also to other countries. Um, just your general thoughts about that, because it's a little bit different than what you're negotiating with the Europeans, but I think ours is more robust. Uh, I think the most important thing is it's consistent, and I think that progress you are making uh, will help us with progress that we are trying to make, and I hope that vice versa can uh, it can help too, that this can be a virtuous cycle. So uh, we do know about your legislation. Uh, we're very encouraged by it and uh, want to continue this conversation with you. I appreciate it. I yield. Ali, next in order of appearance would be Senator Menendez. Um, that, that'd be wonderful. I mean, we've got colleagues all coming in. And I think we better stick to the order of um, appearance or we're just never going to get out of here. Senator Menendez will be next. Okay. And we're, we only have a few other senators, so I think we can get this done pretty quickly. But Senator Whitehouse has been Mr. Collegiality. So, Senator Menendez. Okay. Uh, Ambassador, I've continued to hear from many New Jersey businesses about the importance of GSP which Congress has unfortunately failed to renew since it expired in 2020. That has cost importers in New Jersey alone over $182 million. And beyond the direct monetary effects, allowing GSP to lapse has undermined other parts of our trade policy. So, Ambassador, how does the lapse of GSP hamper our efforts to combat China's malign trade practices? Well, I suppose what I would say here is, um, you know, recalling that GSP is um, our foundational trade and development program. Uh, GSP um, uh, provides us with an ongoing program to support development of our uh, developing country partners. Uh, and those are partners who uh, almost all of them have um, very vibrant, strong and growing uh, relationships and trade with uh, China as well. Um, I would note that um, I spent some time with the Ways and Means Committee yesterday, uh, and I, uh, there was a lot of focus on GSP because they are marking up a GSP bill today. 
the administration's position is to support GSP reauthorization, of course, with appropriate updates um, on uh, uh, anti-corruption, human rights, uh, rule of law, uh, labor, and environment, and also encourage Congress and the two committees to look at other LAPS programs that are relevant here, too, like TAA. Well, I appreciate that. I hope look forward to seeing them do that and uh, for us to have an opportunity. In New Jersey, 94% of GSP tariffs paid since expiration were for products that face Section 301 tariffs uh, when imported from China. Uh, that means allowing the GSP to lapse, we've weakened the effects of our Section 301 program. It's also cost us leverage, in my view, in negotiating with our trade partners. So um, I, I see it as a key component of our trade policy, and uh, I'm glad to hear that the House is moving. I, lo I look forward to being able to do that as well. Um, earlier today, we had a hearing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about the Indo-Pacific, our challenges with China. Um, and I think that having heard a whole host of hearings and experts in this regard, there is a I would say, a nearly universal consensus that as part of our meeting the China challenge, we cannot do so unless we have uh, robust trade agreements in the Indo-Pacific. In trade agreements that ultimately mean not just to uniformity of process and certain standards, but that create market access. If, in fact, that part of our China challenge, which this Congress in a bipartisan way seems to be focused on trying to meet, uh, access to markets is a key part of it. Uh, when will the administration get to moving in that direction? So, Senator Menendez, I'll begin with what I wholeheartedly agree with, which is that um, we should have vibrant uh, trade negotiations uh, and trade programs with um, our partners, uh, our, our strategic partners, um, and that those trade agreements should reflect our values. Now, with respect to the Indo-Pacific, I think that um, one of the challenges is particularly pronounced because of geography, which is um, that so many of the existing supply chains have links in and through China. And that for us, in order to bring an economic engagement program to uh, the region uh, that adds value for us and adds value for our partners is really about supply chain diversification, as opposed to all of us through these um, uh, trade agreements uh, further entangling ourselves into existing Chinese supply chains. So I think that the, the key to how we do that is how do we develop um, uh, programs within our trade agreements, including on tariffs, that will help us to diversify and create parallel supply chains uh, that don't actually worsen the challenge that we but, all have. But we could do that through trade agreements as well. We don't need to do it exclusive of trade agreements. All I'm saying is that without market access, you have China, an economic behemoth right next door, and neighbors to all these countries, they will act in their self-interest and their self-interest is an economic one as well as a security one. And right now we only have one dimension that we seem to be offering them in part. So I, I commend that to your attention. Finally, uh, your 2024 trade policy agenda states that the Chinese Communist Party's use of state-sponsored forced labor is, quote, not just an extreme form of unfair competition, but a moral stain. Uh, I certainly agree with your characterization. But closer to home, I want to remind you and my colleagues that the Cuban government also uses forced labor to advance its political and economic objectives. I raise the Cuban regime's forced labor practices in the context of Article 23.3 of USMCA, which requires parties to eliminate all forms of forced or compulsory labor. It was reported last year that Mexican President uh, Lopez Obrador has been importing doctors from Cuba and financing the regime. These doctors are not going voluntarily. They're sent by the regime, and our own State Department has listed it as forced labor. Have you reviewed the applicability of USMCA's forced labor standards on Mexico's decision to host Cuban forced Bri labor doc? Bri briefly, uh, Ambassador. Yes, Senator Menendez. I think it's a trafficking challenge as opposed to that forced labor import ban, which is about the products of forced labor. Uh, but um, this is an important issue, and um, uh, I'm happy to follow up with you Next on it. Next in order of appearance will be Senator Carper. Ms. Fred, um, I just sat down, and I'm going to yield maybe to whoever's next in line. <laughs> um, next 
in order of appearance would be Senator Daines. Senator Whitehouse has been wonderfully uh, patient, but Senator Daines would be next. Right. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Ambassador Tai, good to have you here this morning. Uh, I want to talk about agriculture for a moment. Uh, it is our lifeblood of our economy in Montana. Um, and then we also realize 95% of the world's consumers live outside the United States. So our farmers and ranchers know very well that the access to trade is absolutely essential to provide um, a future for Montana agriculture. The USTR is charged with opening markets and creating new opportunities for American producers to compete on a level playing field around the world. But frankly, as it relates to agriculture, that's not happening. I am concerned by this administration's unambitious trade agenda and the growing decline in U.S. ag exports. I'd urge you and your team to prioritize action to reverse this very troubling trend. Ambassador Tai, in fact, in the last fiscal year, ag exports declined by more than $17 billion and are forecasted to continue to drop to a record low in the coming year. That is unacceptable. Just met with some of my ranchers this morning from Montana, and they're talking about the soaring prices, the rise in input costs, at the same time commodity prices remaining volatile. Our Montana farmers and ranchers need expanded access to these critical foreign markets just to stay afloat. The current trade deficit is unsustainable, and corrective action is necessary. My question, Ambassador, is what specific actions does the administration plan to take to reverse this widening ag trade deficit? So, Senator Daines, I actually wanted to start by um, saying uh, to you that uh, I, we actually have something to celebrate, which is um, in my confirmation hearing, um, you impressed upon me how important uh, pulse crops and the pulse crop producers are in your state. Mm -hmm. And just in the last year, uh, we've been able to achieve improved market access for lentils and chickpeas to the Indian market, a market that's been very, very challenging for us. So I wanted to begin there with the positive and uh, to acknowledge that um, every one of these conversations uh, makes a strong impression on me, and that it is a strong and important part of the work that we do at USDR. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and thank you for that progress in Pulse. We're one of the leading, we've been the leading Pulse crop producer the United States and access to India is very important for them. Thank you. Super. Um, so from there, you know, I want to address your points on the ag trade deficit. Uh, we have run deficits before in the past, in the recent past. It happens from time to time. Part of the factor is a strong U.S. dollar, but also really, really strong consumer demand here in the United States. Um, that said, you and I have absolutely a shared priority in terms of uh, the work that we want to do um, to uh, continue to boost uh, U.S. ag exports. In fact, even with even with the downturn last year, uh, 2021, 2022, and 2023 were uh, record-setting years for U.S. ag exports at 173, 197, and then 179 uh, billion dollars. And I think that the drop even for 2023 reflects growth from 2021 numbers. And again, I know uh, we've been through a pandemic, so uh, everything about the global economy is a bit more volatile than we would like. Um, that said, um, you know, for your state as well, uh, we have opened up um, uh, Japan for more beef by expanding that safeguard. Um, uh, Japan, we also uh, have allowed for U.S. producers to capture up to 100%. Uh, that's the entirety of uh, the Japanese ethanol market. Uh, we've just gotten Jordan to drop tariffs on eggs, Colombia for poultry, Bangladesh for cotton across the board. Uh, our focus is to score those singles and doubles that we can do with more agility, uh, faster, uh, with more effective results for um, our uh, farmers and producers. And again, uh, I know that we're going to have differences of opinion, but I just want to reinforce how important our farmers are to us, from the large farmers all the way down to the small family farmers. Um, thanks, thanks for the answer. I wanted, uh, before we wrap up here, my time, talk about TPP for a moment. I've called on our presidents, both parties, mm -hmm. Republican or Democrats, to re-engage on the Trans-Pacific Partnership to boost the American economy through fair trade with partners. I think a very strategic part of figuring out what to do about China in the Indo-Pacific. 
This should be a priority as China advances alternative agreements in the region now without the United States. Here's my question. Um, does the administration have any plan to prioritize market access agreements and enforce existing agreements in the Indo-Pacific? Um, let me put it this way again. This builds off my answer to Senator Menendez, but this is my answer to you, which is um, where we do agree. I do agree that um, it is important for us to have a robust trade and economic relationship with the countries in the Asia and Indo-Pacific. Um, the focus, I think, whether it's market access or other rules aspects of trade agreements is how do we bring a program to our partners that will help us diversify our supply chains and make each other more resilient. And I think that that is the key question for um, how we develop a program that necessarily will look different from TPP, especially around those tariffs, but how important it is for us to do that. Thank you. Time and gentlemen's expired. Senator Carper's next. Thanks. Uh, welcome. It's, uh, it's great to see you. Thank you. You have a hard job, and you knew that when, uh, when you signed up for it. But thank you for taking it on, and, and our thanks to the folks sitting behind you who are part of, uh, of, of your team. Uh, as you know, uh, the pandemic uh, highlighted the fragility of global uh, supply chains and the importance of medical innovation for our national security. Uh, I applaud our president's recent efforts to shore up supply chains across industries and the U.S. trade reps' um, request for public comments to inform new actions on supply chain resiliency. Strong and uh, diverse supply chains with our allies are vital to ensuring that medical su supply uh, chains are resilient in the future and ensuring that Americans have access to the products that they need uh, when they need them. I was pleased to see that your office will explore tariff and non-tariff negotiations with the European Union and the United Kingdom as part of its uh, work uh, plan in 2024. Uh, Europe has uh, been an historically important partner, as you know, for uh, medical supply chains, and it is clear that there's more work to be done to strengthen those relationships with uh, our allies. My question, uh, do you agree that um, initiatives focused on eliminating tariff and non-tariff <coughs> barriers to goods like medical products should be one tool in our toolbox to promote supply chain resiliency with our allies around the world? Senator Carper, was your question, I'm sorry, I missed it, um, all, the entirety. Uh, do I agree that tariffs can be um, a, a, an important tool in um, uh, enhancing supply chain resilience for medical no. products? No, uh, let me just re repeat it verbatim, Thank Lauren. You. Do, you, uh, do you agree that uh, initiatives focused on eliminating tariff and non-tariff barriers to goods um, like medical products should be one tool, one tool in our toolbox to promote supply chain resiliency with, with our allies around the world? I think it could be, absolutely. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, hearing from our stakeholders on that specific question with respect to the uh, Federal Register Notice exercise. Second question. In February this year, the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, along with Freedom House, and a number of others, um, ex advocacy groups, uh, as well as academics, sent a letter uh, expressing concern with the United States' decision to withdraw from the key digital commitments at the World Trade Organization. But that letter outlines the impact of digital trade across sectors and the importance of ensuring that the United States has a seat at the table in order to help write the rules of the road, both for creators and uh, small and medium-sized uh, businesses that must um, adapt to the changing digital landscape. Here's my question. As you work uh, with our friends in the White House and other agencies to develop the United States position on digital trade, can you commit to us to working with a broad group of stakeholders as well as U.S. creators across industries to build out the United States posture on digital trade commitments? Absolutely, Senator Carper, and it's something that we are already doing. Uh, but yes, I know that commitment is very consistent with our approach, which is to ensure that um, what we are calling digital trade policies on data, in particular data flows, localization, um, um, storage, uh, source code, uh, reflect um, the perspectives and the equities of all of the American economy. So the, the, the clearly 
the biggest of the big, big, big companies, uh, but also smaller ones that might still be big companies, smaller companies that are struggling with access to data, uh, computing power, um, <clears throat> our, our citizens um, who uh, many of you are championing in terms of asserting and creating rights for them uh, on their uh, data privacy, um, <clears throat> uh, on uh, securing uh, where their data ends up, uh, what rights they have, their intellectual property rights as, all, as well. So um, I think this is an opportunity for me to assure you. Uh, I also am looking for a robust engagement with the technologists out there, the people who are actually innovating and who are actually um, <clears throat> Uh, making use of the data and understanding what's happening, including with data brokers. Uh, I know that um, uh, the chairman uh, has um, been lead sponsor on uh, a data broker bill that addresses uh, people and women's uh, health data in particular. Uh, those are all aspects we want to make sure are informing our approach to uh, the development of trade proposals. Yeah, last thing, I, I, it's not a question but I'm going to ask you to answer here, but I'm going to ask you for the record to describe how the administration is working to appropriately use uh, trade tools and work with our trading partners to address climate crisis in ways that foster job creation. I'll ask that for the record. Thank you. And thanks so much for your service. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I, I thank my colleague. I just want to recognize all the remaining members. Just on this point with respect to digital, I feel strongly that keeping, keeping these markets for digital free and open and fighting these sleazy data brokers are not mutually exclusive. We can do both. Senator Young. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Ambassador Tai, it's good to have you before the committee. Uh, I'm going to continue to pull on the thread that uh, Senators Carper and, and, and Wyden have as, as they've emphasized the importance of digital trade to our country, to our national security, to our people. Um, I think not everyone associates uh, the state of Indiana and the industrial Midwest with uh, digital trade and the importance of, of digital trade, but they should. Um, this is a, a potential opportunity for countless Hoosiers to lower costs, uh, especially uh, something top of mind at, at, a, at a time of uh, inflation concerns. Uh, this creates new opportunities for consumers and workers alike. There's an opportunity for us to advance our, our global competitiveness. Um, increasingly, service industries uh, and IT-related industries uh, are an important part of Indiana's economy and much of the rest of the country's economy. So um, I happen to believe, and I, th I think our committee has demonstrated on a broadly bipartisan basis that digital trade is increasing increasingly important to our country. Um, at this moment in history, however, our, our government has not acted as though it's uh, as important as, as this committee seems to believe. So um, <clears throat> under your leadership, USTR is diminishing our role in defending open digital trade rules, to put it pointedly. Can you elaborate, Ambassador, on, on whether there was consultation with the uh, International Trade Commission the White House Council on Economic Advisors, the National Economic Council, uh, or other national security agencies before deciding to scale back our advocacy for open digital trade rules. Senator Young, good to see you. I agree with you that uh, digital touches all of us and is critical to uh, all of our lives. Uh, and that's why uh, it is so important to connect the conversation that we've been having in digital trade with everything else. Uh, yes, uh, there is a lot of consultation that happens in this administration. Um, we consult with each other all the time. Uh, and with respect to these provisions on digital trade, which are of such um, importance and um, focus of this committee uh, relating to data flows, uh, data localization storage and source code. Uh, yes, uh, robust interagency conversations um, began uh, or really heightened uh, in the early parts of last year. So what was the rationale provided by these national security bodies uh, since they were consulted? Um, the, did, did, were they supportive of this decision to scale back U.S. advocacy for uh, open digital trade rules? So, so I'm, I'm going to quibble with you on your characterization of please, what we did because I, I, don't, I certainly don't see it as scaling back. I see it as upgrading and uh, advancing our conversation about uh, what digital trade means. Um, 
When we talk about digital trade, it's really an extension of um, talking about e-commerce, which is how we thought about these issues 20 years ago. Um, the world is vastly different. The level of sophistication in the world of technology, and, and frankly, in the, the public policy debate, is completely different now. If you look at if you look at the provisions that are in question relating to data flows and data localization, let's just start right there. They're really, really, um, they're good signaling. They're good signaling language around free flows of data and prohibitions on data localization. The, the challenge is that, um, you know, it's kind of defining um, uh, where the companies and the private sector can have free reign, and um, it really cabins um, governmental action, regulatory action, into the confines of some exceptions. One of the serious concerns we have, and at USTR, it's because we're also, we're trade negotiators, we're also the trade litigators. Right. We bring cases we also have to defend. That those exceptions make us extremely nervous, given the kinds of debate up here, which are asserting the interests of Americans okay. into this framework, so, um, which with is limited, not reflected in the proposals. And I, I, I give you plenty of time to reframe this conversation. Um, you're a negotiator, in part, so what success can you point to that you have had in persuading your counterparties uh, to uh, adopt rules and to uh, accept those rules in, sh in strengthening uh, our digital trade ties and thus uh, giving influence to the United States of America in this digital economy uh, of, of the present, but especially of the future? Well, um, an important part of negotiations is also um, uh, talking and listening. And in um, our negotiations with the Europeans through the Trade and Technology Council, certainly with uh, the Japanese and the bilateral and um, other formations that we have, including in the Indo-Pacific and those partners, what we see is that um, all of our friends and allies are, are all in the process of struggling with the same types of questions we are having today around privacy, around where you set the limits for uh, who can do what with people's data. And so the progress that we are making is in advancing towards uh, more updated uh, proposals. And you're right, our proposals might not be the same as the Europeans, uh, but we're all facing the same so challenges. So we don't, we don't have, I, I think it's fair to say, I'll close here knowing that my time has already expired, um, we don't have any outcomes yet. I understand that can be the case. Talking and listening has been the outcome. I know that sometimes I, I would regard that as part of the process before you get an outcome. Uh, we're, we're almost at the end of the administration. You've, you've been years in office, and I would hope that we would have had an outcome. It's not always realistic. I think that's a fair way to end it. I look forward to working time, with time, you. Time, time yes, the gentleman's thanks. expired. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you very much. Welcome, Ambassador Tai. <clears throat> I think we're in a happier situation with respect to the CBAM than we have been in past conversations, so uh, I'm very pleased about that, and I would like to um, ask, first of all, if you read uh, John Podesta's remarks to Columbia University. I did have a chance to see those before he delivered them. Are you a part of that White House Climate and Trade Task Force? Um, uh, I asked uh, uh, Mr. Podesta the same question, and I, the answer is yes. Do you know who else is? Uh, I do not know that yet. I haven't seen the list. Can you take a question for the record to fill me in on the status of that task force and who's on it? I would be delighted to. I appreciate that. Okay. Any idea when I might get that answer? Um, uh, QFRs, I think, are due soon. Very good. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm very interested in finding out what, where we are and where it's going. I thought that the speech that uh, John gave was very positive, and I think it reflects, first of all, the um, firm response of the EU, joined by the UK, that they are not going to uh, accept weak alternatives from the US, which is something that I think is terrific, because that helps improve our negotiations here in, um, in Congress. And I want to thank particularly Senator Cassidy for his very productive work with Senator Graham on a Republican counterpart to my border tariff bill. Now, they don't align yet, but you start with your position and then you work together. So um, I'm very appreciative of what they have done and I'm very appreciative that the position of the White House seems to have moved in this direction. So um, I'll make that statement. The other thing I wanted to talk with you about is the uh, loathsome 
ISDS process. Uh, we are not putting ISDS provisions into any new treaties, um, but they exist as hangovers from past treaties. I'm told that it's actually possible to remove ISDS from existing free trade and bilateral investment agreements, and that you are looking at the best way to go about doing that. Can you give me a progress report on that? But let me just elaborate for a moment um, that I really think that there's something very evil about the entire ISDS mechanism. And it's perhaps best embodied by the attack through the ISDS mechanism of the tobacco industry on the little country of Togo. Togo had the nerve to try to control the packaging of cigarettes with warnings about tobacco's known health effects, and they were sued by the world tobacco industry, um, which has enormous resources at its disposal. Uh, Togo is a country of about 8 million people. It has less than 5,000 miles of roads. Its annual budget is about 1.2 billion. It is in no position to take on a international industry like that that can use it to first of all bully Togo into submission and then take that and leverage against other countries. In fact, the tobacco industry even ultimately went up against Australia and got themselves tangled up in the complexity of their effort, but that shows how evil this is. So the quicker we can get rid of that as a vehicle for putting private interest over public interest and putting size and weight over virtue, the better off we will be. And I'd ask for your thoughts on how we can remove ISDS from those existing agreements and treaties? Well, I think we have a number of tools with respect to ISDS um, that, uh, you know, whether they're in bilateral investment treaties or they have standalone or they're incorporated into FTAs, we're looking at this question actively right now with respect to existing ISDS provisions. Um, so you have uh, how, no report on... How they can be improved, but, um, you know, again, this is one of those things where um, we're very, very interested in the views of members of Congress, especially those um, who sit on the Judiciary Committee and uh, are, are Which leading I do. lawyers, indeed. We, um, the U.S. was responsible for pushing a lot of this ISDS nonsense into those treaties in the first place, correct? I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah, okay. Well, Godspeed. Stay in touch with us on the conclusions that you draw. Um, I would add to my existing QFR request for any further information you have on this that would be belabor the time of the committee but might be useful to me and my team as we look to try to rid our trade agreements of this really noxious uh, agreement. Thank you very much, and thank you, Chairman. Thanks. Oh, and Senator Warren is arriving, who's the uh, champion of uh, cleaning up the foul, toxic, noxious, and evil ISDS arrangements. So. All right, we are heading into the home stretch here, and uh, Senator Barrasso, Senator Cardin, and Senator Warren. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Great to see you again. Thanks for being here today. You know, last November, the U.S. Department of Agriculture finalized a rule allowing fresh beet, uh, beef imports from Paraguay. Uh, serious concerns I have with this new rule. Uh, given that Paraguay has a history of foot and mouth disease, the last outbreak, uh, 2012. Here in the U.S., we haven't had a foot and mouth disease since 1929, you know, 100 years. Uh, an outbreak would be catastrophic to American cattle producers. Uh, the Biden administration has stressed the importance of Paraguay as an ally. Uh, I'm just worried about placing one of our largest agriculture industries at unnecessary risk, I mean, number one cash uh, crop in Wyoming, beef. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's approval process for Paraguayan beef was, I believe, questionable. Specifically, the department's Animal Plant Health Inspection Service relied on site visits from 2008 and 2014. So we're making a decision based on a site visit most recently 10 years ago. This means there are no recent in-country site visits to confirm Paraguay's animal health claims. So, as U.S. trade rep, you know, how are you ensuring that the U.S. promotes science-based trade with our allies and relies on the latest, most accurate information prior to granting market access? 
Senator Barasa, thank you so much for uh, raising this particular issue. Uh, it's something that uh, we are um, uh, tracking very closely and um, um, uh, tuning in with respect to the latest uh, events here in the Senate, uh, tracking what may happen in the House and uh, are in conversation with USDA. To your question, um, <clears throat> uh, I get a lot of flack for um, not negotiating traditional big FTAs. Nevertheless, um, it is really important for me to impress upon senators like you from great agricultural producing states that uh, we value our farmers, uh, big and small, um, and our ranchers uh, uh, across the board. Um, and. Um, uh, what I want to highlight is in every single one of our active ongoing negotiations, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific, with Kenya, with Taiwan, we are, um, we are actively negotiating um, uh, agriculture chapters uh, that address this particular issue, especially around uh, science-based approaches to regulating uh, food trade and agricultural trade. Um, so uh, that's been a very, very high priority for us. We are making very, very good progress with uh, all of these partners. And uh, even outside of those types of negotiations, the commitment to science-based, transparent, risk-based um, uh, regulation um, is something we deeply believe in. Well, and I appreciate the concern and the value that you place on our farmers and ranchers. I mean, my concern is science-based, uh, as, you, as you talk about how critically important it is, there hasn't been an on-site visit in 10 years. So I would just hope that you would consider that as you move forward uh, with, with that area. I, I want to move on to the next, which is uh, you know, July of 2023. I sent uh, to you a, a bipartisan letter, bipartisan, bicameral, uh, regarding Mexico's discriminatory policies toward American energy producers. Uh, we urge you to pursue full enforcement action against Mexico. Mexico's policies have violated the historic U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Uh, Mexico continues to favor their state-owned utility and oil and gas companies. Uh, these actions threaten more than $10 billion in U.S. energy investment. Uh, regarding this issue, the 2024 Trade Policy Agenda Report says, as of December 2023, the parties continue to consult on this matter. You're, you're well aware of that. So what concrete steps have you taken to resolve issues with Mexico's energy policies that would protect American producers? So uh, we went through a period of intensive um, consultations and engagements um, with Mexico. Uh, I know the word consultation um, sounds polite. Uh, they can be pretty heavy hitting um, uh, conversations that we have. Uh, I think maybe the most important aspect of um, uh, the work that we are doing on this right now today is with respect to our own companies. Um, we want to make sure that um, steps that we take uh, are well supported uh, by our companies, are coordinated with them. And I think that just for purposes of um, this conversation, I'm happy to follow up with you as well. I'll just put the emphasis there that uh, we remain very, very engaged with our companies uh, around uh, our strategy here. I guess final question, Mr. Chairman, just so you know the timing. Um, why is the U.S. then not requested a dispute settlement panel with relation to this? Uh, it, it is one of the options that we have, and again, it is something that we are talking to our stakeholders about. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. I thank, uh, thank my colleague, Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Ties, good to see you. On March 26, the third busiest port in the United States was closed. A tragic event causing six people to lose their lives and the, the destruction of the key bridge. The Port of Baltimore was closed. It is, handles $80 billion of foreign commerce every year, 1.2 million containers, number one in roll off, roll on, whether it is auto or farm or construction equipment, affecting the supply chains in this nation and globally. President Biden committed the whole government approach to help Baltimore and getting the bridge replaced, getting the harbor opened, and taking care of the challenges. So my question to you, I'll be meeting with my, our port administrator tomorrow. Um, what can you do to help in regards to this tragedy, uh, in regards to supply chain, in regards to the return of the Port of Baltimore to full strength? Uh, tell me how you can help us. 
Senator Cardin, I'd like to begin just first and foremost with uh, expressing uh, condolences. Our thoughts are with the families of and the loved ones of the workers who lost their lives, um, the first order tragedy. Um, second, uh, we are so incredibly, incredibly grateful for the brave first responders um, who were on the scene uh, and rescuers um, who helped to contain uh, the immediate aftermath. Um, and we stand with the people of Baltimore. Um, and all those affected uh, by this accident. Um, to your specific question about uh, what USTR can do, let me say a little bit about what USTR has been doing. Uh, immediately, and uh, I, again, I want to acknowledge the contributions of my uh, fearless and vigilant uh, chief agriculture negotiator, Ambassador uh, Doug McCaleb, who's sitting behind me. Uh, he leapt to action immediately, especially with thoughts around um, uh, how this um, tragedy uh, would be affecting the trade uh, and uh, agriculture trade um, specifically. Um, and uh, he's been the conduit for um, engaging with our stakeholders uh, and connecting them to uh, the effort that's being driven uh, by the NEC. Um, Second, um, uh, USTR has been engaged throughout the interagency process being convened by the NEC. Um, the process has been, I'm glad to say, holistic, communicative, and timely. Uh, we remain in close contact um, on a daily basis with relevant government authorities to ensure there is as little disruption um, to the supply chains as possible. And we'll continue to stand ready uh, to use um, uh, additional USTR tools when we're called upon to do so. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge President Biden has been incredible here, including uh, helping us preserve the contracts with the Port of Baltimore. We recognize there's going to be some diversions as a result of the port not being open. We hope it'll be opened to about 75% of capacity by the end of the month and 100% by the end of May. Uh, but there is a need to have the understanding of some of our international players. And it seems to me that the USTR can play a role in making that a reality, carrying out the President's commitment to help the people of Baltimore. So. Uh, we may be calling on you to do a few more things. Please do, Sen sir. Senator Cardin, all of us are prepared to help you on the Baltimore issue and, uh, and what you're dealing with, and certainly the Finance Committee will be there. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. It's, it, is, it has been in, in, incredibly difficult, um, and I, I agree. The, our prayers are with this, the families of the victims uh, and the, the workers who have been dislocated as a result of the closing of the port. 20,000 jobs about $15 million a day, every day of the delay of opening up the port. But I want to give a big shout out to the Coast Guard, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, President Biden. Uh, the, the unified command has really been a unified command. I've, I've never seen the cooperation that we've gotten there and, and the progress that's been made. It is a nightmare to try to clear out the port. Uh, the, the, the degree, the steel and concrete is mingled on the bottom of a 50-foot channel. Uh, and the engineers are performing miraculous work. So I, I thank you for that. We've had a tremendous outpouring, uh, and uh, uh, we, we'll be calling upon all of you. because on, on it. Senator Warren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So corporations have long used secretive trade negotiations as a backdoor cheat to try to undermine regulations and to trigger a global race to the bottom. Now big tech is running this play, and one of the demands is, it's, uh, is blanket protections for the, quote, free flow of data, which they want to guarantee big tech companies' right to sell Americans' personal information anywhere in the world. In other words, big tech wants to keep auctioning off your data to the highest bidder, mm -hmm. even when that means that your data makes it to the Chinese or Russian government. Now, Ambassador Tai, as U.S. trade rep, you have stood up to big tech's trade agenda and to China's digital authoritarianism. Tech lobbyists would have us believe that their data flows language will persuade China to abandon its surveillance state and to tear down the Great Firewall. Back when China joined the World Trade Organization, supporters made exactly the same claim, arguing that trade would transform China into a liberal democracy. Ambassador Tai, remind me, uh, did that happen? What has been China's track record on meeting its WTO commitments that it made at the time and moving toward a liberal democracy? 
Senator Warren, um, this is one of the greatest uh, disappointments, I think, in uh, trade policy over the course of the last 25 years. I've had a lot of conversations with um, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle uh, around um, China's accession to the WTO um, and um, uh, their descriptions of how disappointed they are uh, in terms of their expectations um, is very deep. All right. So now big tech is making the same claim that if we will just let big tech sell off our data wherever they want, China will become a more open democratic country. Uh, you know, President Biden has not been fooled by this. In February, he issued an executive order to prevent big tech companies from transferring huge swaths of Americans' financial, health, and other data to China and other countries of concern. Ambassador Tai, how would the president's data security executive order square with big tech's demand for free data flows in all situations? And let me just ask, is this why you rejected big tech's demands so that the U.S. government can take actions like the president's order to protect Americans' data from adversaries? Senator Warren, to, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, both with respect to the administration's executive order safeguarding the security of Americans' bulk data um, from uh, all flowing into China and, and never coming back out, uh, but also with respect to all of the activity that's happening up here uh, in the Congress. Uh, we saw a uh, data broker's bill move through the House uh, and pass on a 414 to zero basis. Uh, we see uh, the data broker bill um, that has been introduced by uh, the chairman um, and Senator Hirono, um, <clears throat> as well as uh, a lot of the other legislative efforts up here, again, to define the rights that Americans have uh, with respect to their data, uh, as well as um, being concerned with the onward flow of that data uh, to places um, that make it unsafe for us. Yeah, and I very much appreciate uh, you're making sure that trade policy is not a way to block appropriate regulations that Congress and the President are trying to put in place. I want to hit one more issue, and that is the USTR's annual report listing foreign barriers to U.S. trade and investment. Up until now, corporate interests have stacked this report with kind of a laundry list of any other policy from any other country that they think somehow nips into their own profits. But not you. You haven't fallen for this. This year, you refused to label common sense tech policies from the EU, from Canada, and from other allies as trade barriers. And by the way, those are policies that look a lot like the ones we're actively working on here in the United States. Now, big tech is screaming that you aren't protecting them from these dangerous foreign adversaries like Canada. Uh, Ambassador Tai, did you remove China's abusive data and intellectual property uh, policies from the trade barrier report? We did not. You did not. Uh, so you're still taking on China's abusive right. digital policies, but big tech is throwing a tantrum, even though there is a clear difference between our allies' good faith efforts to regulate and China's digital authoritarianism. Look, big tech doesn't want to be regulated, period. And it hopes that it can use trade policy to help insulate them from any regulation. I am glad to see that you and President Biden are giving big tech's digital trade agenda the boot and instead fighting for the protection and security of Americans' data. Thank you. Thank, thank my, my colleague. Just to wrap up, and we'll, we'll liberate you here momentarily, Ambassador, just on this question of technology policy. I showed up in the United States Senate when only one senator knew how to use a computer. That was Pat Leahy. And I decided then it was one of the areas that I wanted to go in on. And my horse was small business, small business. And I put on this kind of prism so the big guy's going to be able to take care of themselves. My interest is small business. So I'm very glad that the White House is now working with everybody on this, the whole of government approach. And 
just so everybody knows, I'm going to be pushing hard that these policies like forced localization are just poison for small businesses. There's just no way they can move ahead if they're going to be paying for servers and all the rest. So we can have this discussion another time. You've been um, very patient. Uh, we got a lot to do. And, and, you know, Ambassador, I think we started close to three hours you know, ago. Obviously, we feel very strongly about enforcement issues, and trade barriers, and, uh, and the like. Um, this is a challenge, obviously, to strike a balance on a lot of these you know, issues. We uh, very much appreciate the shipbuilding 301 investigation. I get your point on how it all worked and all the rest. Let's just play more offense. Let's just play more offense. That's what you heard from the committee. Um, after TPP, and you and I have talked about this many times, Senator Brown and I reached out to pretty much the entire Senate and said, how can we do two things? How can we be fair and protect our workers and our businesses? And how can we open markets? That's why you heard all of us you know, talking up here. So let's uh, find some ways to advance this kind of uh, agenda. Uh, for senators, uh, questions for the record are due April 24th. Uh, Senator Crapo, do you have anything you want to add? With that, we're adjourned. <laughs>